Welcome to Prisoner Justice Day here in so-called Canada, a day where we commemorate the lives lost in prisons across this nation and talk about the ongoing struggle for liberation rights and life inside the walls in Canada. I'm Elle Jones. I'm joining you from unceded, unsurrendered Mi'kmaq territory here in Mi'kma'ki. And I'm joined by Justin Pichet, who's joining you from so-called Ottawa. Um, Justin will come on screen in a minute. Normally, I'm co-hosting with Desmond Cole, but he's not available. But I want to give him a shout out because this is our fifth year of doing this national broadcast. So the Abolition Coalition, which is made up of a group of activists, formerly incarcerated people, family members, and allies from across the country began doing this broadcast to bring attention to the different events that take place across this country, both inside and outside of prisons uh, on this day. And so as we go through this broadcast, we will be moving from coast to coast, from Halifax all the way to Vancouver, to show you some of the different events that have taken place. We'll be joining some live, we'll be sharing some interviews and recordings that have been made from incarcerated people. We'll be sharing some words from inside and we'll also be featuring live interviews with people as we go. So um, this day would of course be nothing without those people inside who have been fasting and on strike today. Um, this is the 49th year that Prisoner Justice Day has been observed in Canada and is 50 years since the death of Ed Nalan who died by suicide um, inside the walls at Millhaven. And a year after his death, prisoners began Prisoner Justice Day both to commemorate his death and to draw attention to the prison conditions that led to his death by suicide. And ever since then, people across this country inside cells and behind walls have commemorated this day um, by withdrawing their labor from the prison system and by fasting in honor of all those who are dead and all those who continue to live in unfreedom. So throughout the show, we will be sharing words of people who are incarcerated and we first and foremost send our love and thanks to those behind walls today whose activism created this day and who continue to create and um, fight for abolition across this country. Justin, are you joining me? Can I get you on screen? Here we go. Okay, so introduce yourself, Justin. Hey everyone, uh, Justin Pichet, um, he, him pronouns. I'm here coming from unseated and unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory and so-called Ottawa, um, member of the Criminalization and Punishment Education Project, uh, the coalition against the proposed prison uh, that the Ford government wants to build on farmland with floodplain uh, in Kempville, and also uh, co-editor of the Journal of Prisoners on Prisons. I'm here mostly doing background stuff, getting links up uh, and running for interviews and clips from events today that have been sent. Uh, from across the country so pretty excited to be doing this again and thanks so much to l for uh hosting and um hopefully you won't see my face too much tonight so for everyone who's tuning in this is always a kind of seat of our pants operation obviously we all do this um due to our solidarity with people inside so be prepared for some glitches we try to keep it as smooth as we can if you're tuning in but we're dealing with a lot of recordings we're going live to different events uh we have a lot of pieces in the air and obviously but not like CBC or something. So um, do bear with us as we go through this day, but we think the most important thing on this day is that it is recognized um, that we continue on the outside of those walls to so show solidarity with those inside and that we always recognize, commemorate and push forward on this day. So for you, those of you just joining us, um, if you don't know what Prisoner Justice Day is, as I said, we are actually celebrating this year, the 50th anniversary of the death of Eddie Nalen. Eddie Nalen died alone in a segregation cell in Millhaven Maximum Security Penitentiary, which is located in Kingston, Ontario. And that was in 1974 on August 10th. A year later, in an act of solidarity, Prisoner's Justice Day was first observed by imprisoned people held in the same Canadian federal penitentiary who engaged in a one day hunger strike and work strike in support of their demands to end solitary confinement and other injustices behind bars. Um, if you want to know more about this day, which is probably one of the most important and sustained prisoner run efforts that draws attention to prison conditions, you can find that history and many of the issues of focus over the years at prisonjustice.ca. So that's prisonjustice, all one word, .ca. And I don't know if we're in some kind of live, if we can put that up on the chat. Um, and there's also pieces available at penalpress.com. That's P-A-N-A-L-P-R-E-S-S, -S, penalpress, all one word, dot com. 
and also published in Journal of Prisoners on Prisons, which is the only peer-reviewed academic journal that features works by currently and formerly incarcerated people. So since 50 years ago, 49 years ago, Prisoner Justice Day has been marked by people inside and outside prison walls across the world demanding change. To commemorate the lives lost to human caging, take stock of the current deadly situation at sites of confinement, and organize for change in solidarity for justice and abolition across prison walls, PJD events are once again taking place across the country. Uh, yesterday, for example, there was an important commemoration of PJD on the grounds of the Sudbury Jail. There was also a press conference by the Tracking Injustice Project on their new deaths in custody database, part of which we will be airing here in a few minutes. And so for those of you who perhaps didn't see that story, as you may or may not know, in Canada, there is, in many provinces, there is no requirement for any kind of inquiry or review if someone dies in custody. In my province, for example, there is no demand in Nova Scotia for uh, inquiry into deaths in custody. And in many cases, the names are not even known, let alone the circumstances, let alone any kind of investigation. In Nova Scotia, in the past six months, six lives have been lost alone inside our provincial jail, and I will read those names later. Um, and so within this country, there's been little attention to the deaths of people in custody and little will to not only discover those names and circumstances, but certainly to change the conditions that lead to those deaths, which of course would include abolishing prisons as well. So this project, led by Dr. Alexander McClelland, has gone to work to track the data and circumstances. It's extremely traumatic work. I know those who were involved in the press conference yesterday have gone through incredible um, trauma and suffering, just engaging with having to see the different circumstances of deaths, the terrible conditions, the lack of attention, the cover-ups, the uh, families that have not had answers. And so that culminated in a press conference yesterday, um, which named over 2,100 deaths in custody that have taken place uh, in the last, I want to say, 50 years. I hope that's correct. Um, and that number has accelerated within the past few years. So we are now at an average of, I believe, 118 deaths in custody between the provincial and federal system per year. And so rather than those conditions being alleviated or improved, we are, in fact, seeing them get worse. So that should tell us today, as we move from Halifax to Winnipeg, to Regina, to uh, Vancouver, and then also hear from smaller uh, cities as well that have been doing commemorations. If we're wondering why we are here today and why we still commemorate this event and why it's important, it is because these conditions continue. Prison continues to injure, to maim, and to kill. It continues to harm communities. It continues to divide families and it continues to have absolutely zero effect in reducing crime or helping trauma or helping victims while continually increasing the trauma and violence that it actually causes. In prison, people live with and develop health conditions and disabilities at a higher rate than the general population, while they are also exposed to deplorable conditions of confinement, such as lockdowns, poor air quality, a lack of air conditioning, and you can think about the heat this summer, um, many people have struggled to even get a fan. We see a lot of deaths by people either that are older prisoners, people with high blood pressure, diabetes, and chronic health conditions that literally die of heat because they will air condition the places where the guards are, the bubbles, and not air condition the ranges uh, simply to cause prisoners to suffer. We also know that with forest fires, other preventable disasters, prisons are often located in remote regions. Um, that are very vulnerable to these environmental changes and disasters as well. And so the risk of people dying behind bars from both um, conditions inside, from suicide, from overdose and death by toxic drug supply, as well as through other causes such as being killed by guards um, is incredibly high. So lives are at stake and we need more humane alternatives to the deadly practice of incarceration, which already exists. So it is time to work towards those futures now. So with that said, um, again, we want to acknowledge and thank all those inside today. And we're going to move to uh, showing you a bit more about the Tracking Injustice press conference. So this took place yesterday uh, ahead of PJD. They released a public database of deaths and custody across Canada since the year 2000. So for the last quarter of a century. 
Um, some of the findings, I'm sorry, I said five decades. I was off by a factor of two. It was 25 years. So in only 25 years, the database includes 2,131 deaths in custody since the year 2000. I'm going to say that again, 2,131 deaths in custody since the year 2000, which is inclusive of police custody, prisons, jails, youth detention, immigration, and psychiatric detention. And it's important to remember that incarceration doesn't take place only in prisons, but also includes things like immigration detention. And if people have been following along, if you're a prison news follower, you may know that after a long battle by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, uh, provinces were pressured to abolish the use of provincial jails to incarcerate people who are here on immigration hold. In other words, people that are only in jail for administrative reasons. So they are not accused of committing any crime. They are simply being held in custody because you may not be able to access their papers or they don't have a place to live or there's no way to identify them because they're fleeing a war zone. So people without status are held in provincial facilities. And so there was a big push to prevent that from happening because of course we have the means, first of all, to keep people in community. Should people need to be surveyed, we not that we advocate that, but there is an ability to do that. And of course, these are not people accused of crimes. They are people who simply move their body from one place to another. After fighting that battle and getting provincial custody eliminated for uh, people on immigration hold, rather than accepting that the practice was not necessary, the government has instead committed to now holding immigrants in federal prison. So again, People that are not accused of crimes, not that people accused of crimes should also be in prison, right? Like we're not here to say that everybody else should be in prison, but to show you the illogic and evil and cruelty of prison, uh, the idea that we just use it to control whoever we want. So rather than saying this practice is not necessary, they are simply now shifting the site of incarceration. And much like so many other deaths in custody, we do not track the deaths in immigration detention. In many cases, you cannot find a name. We don't know anything about the racial makeup, country of origin. There's horrible stories about bodies not being released to their families. Um, stories where, for example, the widow of a man who died in custody could not leave her house until the body was returned due to her religious practices, but the state would not return his body. So she had to spend months uh, cases where people have died in transport on planes and their families have not found out. So just horrific, horrific conditions. Um, same thing with psychiatric detention, which have incredibly high amounts of suicide and which um, I was personally told by a head psychiatrist that, quote, the index crime has nothing to do with how long we hold people. So you could be sent into psychiatric detention because you shoplifted a bottle of pop and stay there for 50 years. Um, there is no housing options. So often people are simply being held in these places because there's no options to release them. Um, so we are incarcerating at high rates people, again, whose crime is suffering from mental illness in a society that claims to be attentive to mental health and increases our rhetoric around, oh, we need to self-care and we need to talk about mental health. Yet uh, we hold people um, in the most deplorable conditions within prison conditions simply because they are seen to need psychiatric intervention. Um, so it's just important to remember that. So just to go back to uh, the findings from this research, to as, as I said, over 2000 deaths since 2000, the average age of deaths is 44 years old. Overall, the life expectancy in Canada is 81 years old. So we can see that being held in prison in Canada can cut your life expectancy almost in half. There's an average of 87 deaths per year in the database. But for the past 10 years, that number has risen to 118 per year, which indicates a potential increase in deaths in custody overall. 2021, which is also during the height of the COVID pandemic and lockdowns, was the highest year on record with 196, so nearly 200 deaths in custody in the database. Among the leading causes of death include, and I, I know this may be, um, traumatic to talk about. So those of you who are listening to this broadcast, I do want to pause and say, because this broadcast obviously uh, comes from a, a day commemorating, beginning in the commemoration of the death of a man, Ed Nalen, by suicide. Um, throughout the broadcast, we will be talking about some very brutal conditions, um, self-harm, 
suicide and other extremely traumatic things. So we do urge you as you listen to also um, be attentive to each other, be attentive to those around you. Know if this, you know, if, if you are feeling that listening to this material is bringing back trauma, we do ask you to um, like be attentive to that. We are going to be speaking about some really dreadful things, some horrors in this broadcast. Uh, so deaths by suicide made up 21%, 452 deaths, and 14% were by preventable deaths by toxic drug supply, which made up 299 deaths. And um, we're going to post a link for you to the, yesterday's press conference, the database and blog posts outlining their findings on the Facebook Live. And we encourage you to read and share this information and not just read and share it, but do something with it. Um, at minimum, you know, lobby your MP ask questions of your MP around the federal prison system, um, take forward, uh, think about how we can protest, uh, how we can work for better conditions. We should all have questions, for example, for things like the Canadian like Medical Association, the medical staff within these uh, facilities, why there are not reviews, um, why there are not inquiries, why people aren't being called at least to explain this stuff. And these are all things we should be advocating for. So that's, I know I've given you a long intro, so you can stop hearing from me. And we're going to play a clip from the press conference, which features an intervention by a mother whose son died in custody. And Alex McClelland from Tracking Injustice will introduce this clip. So thank you for joining us. And we're going to move to this clip. And I ask you all again, as you listen through this broadcast, to please take care of yourselves as you listen to this and use bearing witness throughout this broadcast to motivate us to continued action. We're having Justin's just getting it set up. Hopefully we have it. And I especially want to acknowledge particularly mothers, but the many parents of people who have been incarcerated um, who do this work. Um, we really, really honor you. I know what it takes to speak out when somebody you love has died, uh, been murdered by the state in these circumstances, how much stigma and shame there is, how many people will spend their time blaming you, blaming the person. So it takes a, a lot of courage and we really want to acknowledge the mothers in particular and parents and family members who speak out at this time. Justin, do we have that queued up? Are we good to go? Yeah, I'm just uh, clicking the share now. So apologies for, for that. Here we go. Let's uh, hope this works. Thanks everyone for your patience. How to um, hand it over um to sandy pitzel and thank you first for being here um, much respect and gratitude to you and also my condolences for the loss of your son jordan norfield who died in the year 2020 in police custody in prince albert saskatchewan i wondered if you could share with everybody how you want your son to be remembered how you first found out about our project and what you'd like to see change in the system that led to your son's death well, the toughest one is just like people had mentioned at the beginning, we're talking about death. And I know as a loving mom, uh, this is the first time actually that I'm speaking publicly. Um, and, you know, when the other speaker before me was talking, you know, he mentioned like a lot of the newspaper articles, there were newspaper articles when uh, there was an inquest into my son's death. Um, and uh, it was October 30th to November 2nd, 2023. So it just closed recently. And uh, a lot of the information, just like the previous speaker said as well, was new information to me. Um, you know, what the coroner told me was a lot different than what was presented. And I found out a couple months before how different that was. Um, I think remembering my son is the tough one. I know the other moms would probably agree because love stays, you know, like I love all my children. I have three other children that are adults and I love them all equally. And my son, Jordan, was my first son. He looked like me. Uh, he never wanted to see anybody suffer or be hurt. Every 
but it was his buddy. He'd say, Hey mom, you know, can you buy my buddy, you know, a, a you know, a, a meal too, if I was visiting with him or whatever. And I'd say, Oh, like, when did you meet your buddy? Like afterwards? And he'd say, Oh, just today, <laughs> you know? So he was really friendly. Uh, every time, no matter what was going on that we were together, we would have a laugh every single time. And so that's a little bit of insight into my son. Uh, I'm First Nations for those people um, who are joining us. I'm from English River, uh, Dene Nation in Northern Saskatchewan, Treaty 10. My son was Métis. And um, I um, found out about injustice and was really impressed with it. Um, I talked with uh, Dr. Alexander McClelland, um, because I was searching my son's name. When you cannot talk about your, your child's death, he was 30 years old when he, he died. Um, he was overnight in a police cell and he was laying for the last three hours, uh, before he was transported to hospital, um, face down on the cement floor and was convulsing for over three hours. And so I didn't actually find out he was there until uh, later on. I did hear from the hospital the second day he was there. From police custody on the second to the hospital, he was uh, transported December 2nd, and he died three days later on December the 5th. So I was just searching my son's name because there's all these articles like the previous speaker said where it's like oh you know he died in you know cells at the police and it has somewhat of a negative con connotation there's a stigma about the word prisoner you know so here he is um and you know i was just searching and the positive thing i found was injustice my son's name was listed it's like a memorial site really to me it's like a positive listing of all uh, the people who have died in custody. And so my son's name was there and I contacted um, uh, Dr. McClelland when I saw he was with Carleton University and I wanted to add his race was unknown and I wanted to know that, you know, the project to know that he was Métis. It was important to me to give them more information. And I'm going to stay involved with them um, because of the initiatives they're doing. And so moving forward, uh, the third question I had was um, to say, what would I like to see changed? Uh, there's many things, but a few things would be, one, I think the automatic default when uh, police are involved with, um, you know, being involved with, with people in the community is that the default, instead of taking them overnight to a, a jail cell, is if they are in medical distress or, you know, some, some of our people are intoxicated that I read, you know, that the default is to take it where, you know, they get that better care. Because I hear in general from public comments, um, I'm a social worker, so I hear, you know, oh, you know, police aren't aren't uh, doctors, they're not nurses, then I think just like similar to being in a school setting with our young people that if somebody is having a convulsion um, or there's some sort of unknown medical condition that they should be immediately transported to the hospital. I think that should be the default. Um, and, you know, in everything, there's an exception. You know, if there's like... Um, real, you know, violence or whatever, of course, you know, but maybe that can be looked at. But I think default, that would be important. I think information to families, uh, it is very limited, just so much is similar to what has been said already about access to information. As a family member, we really struggle. And yeah, they ask us to, you know, pay uh, thousands of dollars for information that we'd like to know in the process. So, you know, I struggled for three years before the inquest for my son. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't have, like I say, a lot of information until, you know, a couple months before the inquest. Um, 
Yeah, I love this project because it's research based. Um, all the people, Lindsay involved supporting the families. Um, and so I don't know, I think that's why I'm staying involved is that, you know, they bring in numbers because that's what public wants. Um, you know, they want to know like what's the real facts. And so you get the real facts here, it's building. And yeah, I just wanted to be involved to bring the personal perspective. He's, my son is missed by many family members, you know, so. So that's just a clip of the press conference that aired yesterday, and you can find that uh, the rest of the press conference through Tracking Injustice Project. And again, we urge you to go and look at that database, read the names, um, look at the materials, and then take action. Um, there's a couple of things I just want to emphasize from what was said. Um, so I think importantly to realize, for example, that um, when people are, for example, arrested for being publicly intoxicated, we do not take them to a medical site that can assess and treat that person. They are sent to police cells, um, so they are incarcerated. And there have been a number of deaths, for example, in Nova Scotia, Corey Rogers, who died in the police cells after being arrested for being intoxicated when the police put a spit hood around him and he associated on his own vomit and died. And the police did not check on him. Um, counter to what they were supposed to be doing. They did not receive any jail time and they appealed the penalties they did receive and actually got those penalties lowered. So even though they altered records, did not check on him, um, were sitting around like playing the harmonica and doing like on their phones while this man choked de to death. Um, the police, of course, did not end up penalized and appealed what penalty, little penalty they had. So, um, it's important to understand that we live in a country that treats health issues as though they are crime issues. So treats issues of substance use, addiction, mental health, as though they are in need of punishment. And we hear that in that clip, the idea that you have to advocate for somebody to be taken to hospital immediately should they have a health problem in prison says it all. The idea that people can be pressing the button in their cells and actually be disciplined for misuse of the button rather than being medically assessed that people often have to protest, refuse to lock up, um, literally resist in order to get medical care for other people on their ranges when you realize that somebody is ill and they're not being taken to the hospital and other incarcerated people have to begin protesting just so that person can get medical care. Um, where people have had to, you know, needed insulin and have hit their button multiple times and been given like disciplinary levels for misusing the button. These are all things that happened. And so that's really important to understand from that interview as well. So I urge you to look at the rest of the press conference. And um, I think those links are up on Facebook Live. So we're going to move now uh, to another recorded interview. This is a Center for Justice Exchange interview with Vicki Chartrand. And she is speaking to a Cree man who is imprisoned at Archambault. So Justin is going to pull that up as we wait. Um, do we have that? Here we go. All right. So this is Vicky Chartrand in conversation with a Cree man in prison at Arshambo. Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to another annual national broadcast of Prisoner Justice Day. I'm Vicky Chartrand. I'm the founder and director of the Center for Justice Exchange. And at the center, we work towards uh, more community-based and collaborative approaches to justice. And we look at justice and its multiplicities rather than just simply a criminal justice matter. Uh, with us today, we have someone um, from prison, from Marshambo Prison. He's a Cree man, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, Prisoner Justice Day, what it means for him, and what it's like being um, incarcerated as, as an Indigenous person. Uh, good day. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, well, thanks for, I'm good, thanks for asking. And thanks for being on the show with us today. You're welcome. So can you, um, so as it, it is Prisoner Justice Day today, can you tell us um, a little bit about what it means for you? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> so uh, just sorry. be, no, that, you're good. Just being Prisoner Justice Day, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what uh, Prisoner Justice Day means for you. You know, on that day, I think about um, 
a lot of the guys that I've known in jail who have died through suicide, uh, some who have been killed by uh, guards uh, trying to escape. Um, other guys have been, you know, they died in fights and stuff. Um, I, but I also think about the people outside who are fighting uh, for us. I wish that uh, I wish that the mainstream public knew more about the prison system. Um, and I think, I think they just would be just as a probably just as a reminder for folks that Prisoner Justice Day is to commemorate and celebrate and and mourn the lives of people lost with, within the carceral walls. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, um, I, if the, I think if the general public knew what people like you knew about the prison system, I think they'd be concerned. Um, Can you tell us an example? Of, yeah. What's that? Can you give us an example of what you mean? Um, just the, the different programs, there's, there, there doesn't seem to be that much that, uh, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was like a lot more programs that were based to help guys to deal with drug use and all this other stuff. And I think they've made them into these, uh, I guess they're super programs now. Okay. And I think by having one of them, uh, before we would have years of programs. But now it's like you do one program and then you have years of nothing to do. You and I working. Yeah. You and I've talked too though, but you've you've worked your programs multiple times over and yep. they're still not but I'm, in any, path, yeah. I'm in pathways, which is right. pathways is that I've always viewed the pathways program to be like a lifetime program because it's a that program that I'm in, it's reconnecting me with my culture with um it's like a daily reaffirm or a daily affirmation um of who you are as a native person um there's like lots of smudging and and circles and things like that so for, for the program i'm in that's a little different and so it's, vital to have access to your traditions and culture Anywhere yeah, you go. That, it's huge for me because that's where I've learned. I didn't know I was Native when I first came to prison. I knew I was part Native, so I identified as Métis. Uh, it wasn't until I just wrote a letter to Indian Affairs one day and asked them if I was Native, uh, and they said I was, and they, they sent me uh, my status number. And uh, up until that point, I didn't know I was first native until yeah, until I was like 24, 25. While in prison, you know, and what an indictment on yeah. our system when people from you know indigenous backgrounds are going to prison to learn about their indigeneity and culture. Yeah, that there, there's for me outside there was never any access, and um, I didn't know who to go and talk to or connect with when I was when I was younger. So yeah, there was a, an issue with that, but uh, in jail, I've, I've learned quite a bit from the elders. Uh, there's been a lot of good elders I've run across. There's been a couple who weren't so great, but there's there's been some who are, are really good. The ones that, and they're they're going through abuses and, and things every day. Yeah, we uh, hear this. People. We hear, we hear, we we hear a lot about what the what the elders themselves have to endure just to be able to connect with with their brothers and sisters inside. Mm -hmm. Can you just to tack back a little bit to the prisoner justice? Excuse me, the prisoner justice day. Because you're mentioning um, what it means for you and, and having yeah. you know the, the people that you've lost over the years, but also the people on the outside who've been you know. Um, uh, standing up to ensure the the transparency and visibility within the system. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, I think I think that day is for for me. It's I just you know I sit back and I I think about those guys that are gone. Um, I know one guy in particular. He he was going to get released the next day. And he hung himself that night. Wow. Uh, the night before he was supposed to get out, he killed himself. And I never understood that. I was angry for a long time why he did that. Yeah. And I, I, I learned at the time, I learned that 
he was concerned that when he got out, he was going to keep doing crime and, and bring problems to his family. And he didn't want to do that. So he killed himself um, mm. before he could get out. So he wouldn't cause his family any more problems. And I, I was angry for the long, I didn't understand that. Uh, I understand it now, but at the time I, I didn't understand it. And I think there's a lot of guys in jail who they regret uh, their lives or their actions. I know for me, my um, my life, uh, you know, by I think in the places that I was in, it formed the person I am now. And and I I think that's uh, it, it happened to native people, yeah, with the residential schools and the scoop and everything. But I, I think it's happened to a lot of other people too, lower income people. I don't think race. For this, I don't think race is really, um, I, I think it's like when I look around in here, I see black guys, white guys, native guys. I don't think race is a, is a big factor with prisoners. So and, uh, I think happen- it's just your, hmm? Well, what happens, so you're saying you put your differences aside, but what, and what happens on Prisoner Justice Day inside for the most part? Uh, for me, I just, I pretty much just sit in my cell and I don't, uh, I don't really go around and, and, uh, socialize with guys. It's not like a big party. It's more of a, um, you know, for, for people like me, you sit back and, and think about, uh, people that are gone. Mm. Um, yeah, think about, uh, my own life and what I plan to do in the future. Um. Yeah, but that that day it, it's just small, you know. Not eating on that day it's a small price to pay, I think, to to commemorate those those people. Um, yeah, I I um, I think that is it's a lot. I think those guys that are gone now, or uh, the people outside that fight for us who are gone, it's it's uh, it's that that um yeah it's just it's it's sad that, that that they're gone and that's what i think about on that day right and what an important point that you know that it's it's not that's with such a magnitude of loss that you know fasting on that day is i think in some ways the least we can do and i and i think you know we we don't often you know i think that there's a vilification of people in prison but at the end of the day like we're talking about human lives, you know, and and sometimes more than human lives too, right? And when we think about the, in the larger scheme of what's important, um, so. I I think everybody in here is going to get out eventually. Mm. Um, and I, how people are treated in here now, I can see it's it's getting worse outside because I think the treatment in prison. Uh, Quebec is, is not so bad, but uh, the western provinces, uh, the prison system federal out there is crazy. What do you mean uh, by that? And, hmm? What do you mean by that? It's so violent. Okay. It's, uh, they, it, it's almost like the, the system picks guys against each other. Um, mm. And it's constantly done... Uh, almost to, to keep us off balance so we're unable to coordinate oh. um a lot of the things like our cut pay and our i, I think those things happen after we took them to court for the, the cigarettes and all that stuff uh i think it upset some people they thought maybe we had too much money and to hire a lawyer uh that's why we never get pay raises in here um right. yeah i i they don't want us sticking together in here they don't want inmates sticking together because we were the only ones that would stand against um, the guards or the institution when they were making unfair policy. Right. And now when everybody's uh, separated now, uh, they're too busy fighting each other. There is no solidarity. Uh, and that, that's a problem. It's an interesting... I don't know if that'll ever get fixed. Yeah, and that, that is a tactic of colonization, right? To keep people um, mm-hmm. segregated and unaware, so... Yeah. Yeah. I uh, and I uh, yeah, I think that they they have learned that over over a 
very long period of time that it's better to keep us separated. And yeah, it's it, that is a that is a colonization. Yeah. And I I I don't know where they practiced which one first, whether it was in prison and they took it outside to deal with native people or native people outside and then they brought it in here to deal with us. Right. It's uh, but yeah, it, it is a tool that they use to, to keep control and to keep power. Yeah, and so Prisoner Justice Day, in many ways, represents some of that solidarity that that's lost throughout the year. And that, yeah, and that is something they actively fight against too, because on that day they offer like the best meal pretty uh, much of the year. That's interesting. So, yeah, and and there there are quite a few guys now who. They go for their meals. They say they don't eat, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not like it used to be. Mm. I think times have changed. And I, I don't think guys nowadays, they, they don't really fight for anything. I think a lot of them think that all the stuff they have in their cells are things they're allowed to have under the law, like it's their right to have this stuff. They don't understand that it was the older guys who fought to get the, the TVs and the clothing and the radios. Uh, it was us that fought to get that stuff. And um, I think now they just think that if they lose it, they can just take it to court and a judge will give it back to them. Um, so, but that's the mindset now. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I, I think it's losing power or I, I don't think they'll they'll crush it all the way but uh they definitely on that day they do try to hamstring up um mm. yeah well and I think it highlights the value of how we need to keep pushing to um commemorate uh, and uh, observe prisoner justice day well, I just wanted, we're, we're running, we're wrapping up here. So I just wanted to uh, thank you so much for your time and insights. And, you know, I think it's so, it's so vitally important that we remember the value of people's lives. That's um, no matter who they are. Yeah, I hope that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things we do when we're younger, uh, like me, that when I was full of anger and uh, rage at the system. I think dealing with my past in residential school and, and the scoop, it changed me. Um, mm. I, I like to think that I'm, I'm becoming the person I was meant to be when I was born and not the person that was created when they took me from my family and put me in uh, uh, the foster system. Right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But thank you for the time and the opportunity to talk. Yeah, no, well, the pleasure is ours. All right, bye now. Well, everyone, take care, and we um, um setting out our, our heart and thoughts to everyone on this day. So that was a uh, Vicky Chartrand in conversation with a uh, Cree man inside Arshambo. Um, we want to really thank both of them for that interview, and particularly, it's so important to hear the voices from those currently inside who are not able to join us today. We're now joined live by Faith Eagle. Uh, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, Faith Eagle is a Sisseton Wapaton Oyate woman who was recently incarcerated in Pine Grove, Saskatchewan, uh, where the prison, uh, where she engaged in a over 10 week hunger strike to protest the conditions, um, including like undrinkable water, so basic human life, um, terrible food, but beyond that as well, all the many, many uh, disgusting and inhumane conditions. And Faith was recently released. So we're really, really grateful. And thank you for taking the time to join us. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Um, could you, I know I gave a little bit of an introduction, but could you just begin by however you want to, just talking a bit about yourself um, and particularly the activism that you've done, but uh, whatever you want to share with us about um, your own work, your own life. My life? Okay. Well, I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to talk about being um incarcerated when you first get arrested and how you're treated um it's i know that, that we get mistreated in jail but when we first get initially arrested from the police in like saskatoon where i was arrested you get treated like you're nothing and um if you don't know how to speak up for yourself then you know you're gonna obviously you're just gonna go through it and just 
think that's how you're supposed to be treated. When I was first arrested, they um they they told me that they were going to drag me into the room because I didn't want to write a statement. And I said, I know my rights as a human. I said, that's not right. And I told them, I said, you guys have body cams. I said, I'm not going to where I don't want to go. I have rights. I'm a human. And as soon as I said that, they stopped. They stopped from trying to like get me to go into that room. But um, and then when I was laying down, they came and stabbed me in the neck with their like, uh, well, they just probably really hard in my neck. They said, oh, we thought you were dead. And just the way they said it. And I said, I'm not dead. I said, I'm here. I said, you could call my name. I said, I, I heard you open because I was sleeping. And then so just and then um, after that, the detectives came in and they're trying to like still harass me and say stuff to me, trying to intimidate me. And I told them, I just said, nope, I'm, I, I'm a human being. I have rights. I'm no. And I said, you guys have no right to do this to me. And as an indigenous, especially uh, as a as a labeled um, like going in labeled, they labeled me a labeled gang member. You're treated like you're not human. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, I was like, well, you know what, even though you guys want to say this and that about me, I'm still a human being and I'm going to speak up for myself. And then when um, I knew, because I was like, when I got arrested, I was dope sick. I was, I was hungover. I was dope sick. And um, I said, just take me to Pine Grove because I know that's what you're going to do anyway. So um, I knew when I, as soon as I went into jail, I knew that this is not how women should be treated. Um I would hear women uh, banging their head off the cell doors, crying, rocking back and forth. There's one woman, one woman in particular, she was so dope sick that her eyes were yellow. And I said, what's wrong? She goes, I'm dope sick. I'm sick. I need my medication. They're not giving it to me. And I was like, wow. I said, you're not, you're not getting your medication. She goes, no, I need medication. And like, she needed some edge, like to get the edge off. So we gave her thrive. We tried to help her as much as we could. And, um, just the different things that I noticed that were going on, the water, how it looked. I was like, wow, I, I grew up, I grew up hauling water. Why do I have to worry about water here? And like, it's like a trauma. It's like traumatizing for me because I already growing up having to haul water as an indigenous person. And so um, I noticed the water, the food, how the women just, how we were mistreated, even like um, on my, in my intake, when I was in intake, they, uh, I was with a Caucasian lady and uh the meds came around and I, and I said, what did you get? And she said, I got vitamins. I was like, wow, they give you, they actually give you vitamins. And she said, yes. So the next day when meds came around, um, I asked for vitamins for myself and uh, the nurse looked at me and just snubbed me. She said, no, and just shut my food slot door. And I was like, wow. I said, well, how did you get them? She goes, I don't know. They just gave them to me. And I, I, we were in the same process, like even like being arrested together. And I knew that she didn't put in a request slip to get medication, like vitamins, at least I wanted something. I wanted something to help me, but I didn't get that. And then I knew that um, I knew that the women's voices in there, they were they were stopped. They were shut. Everybody was too afraid to say anything. And I told them, I said, what are you women doing? I said, what's going on here? What's really going on? It's like, we're too scared to say anything because we're going to get locked up. And I told them, I said, we're already locked up. I said, what more can they do to us? And so when we, uh, when I, st when we started the hunger strike, um, when we're three weeks into it, I didn't, we didn't say nothing because, you know, we didn't want to be, um, we knew that we'd get strip searched. We knew that they're going to do a shakedown. They tossed our beds. They, um, they took us to the nurses. The nurses harassed us. They told us, are you guys on drugs? Why we weren't eating? And they couldn't believe it that we're actually on a hunger strike. And we're like, no, we're not on drugs. You know, we were hungry, like we were thirsty and like we needed hydration. And that's what they kept on saying to us. And they tr they kept on trying to manipulate us. And I, and then I told them, I said, listen, just give us what we need. We don't want to be harassed by you. I said, why are you treating like, why are you treating us like this? And, you know, and I knew that I knew that that uh, did something to the nurses because after that they called a big meeting where I was with the ADDP, like the team leader and the, uh, all the medical staff. And I told them, I said, no, you guys mistreat us and you mistreat as many of the other individuals that were here before me. I said, I told them, I actually told them this. I said, you know what, today, th that was our third week of our hunger strike when we went into that meeting. And um, I told them, you guys are now responsible for every Indigenous that had passed away or, or any other individual that passed away that needed medication. I said, you guys should be charged for first degree murder because you guys withheld things from them when you knew that they needed it. And 
you go, you knew very well that they needed medical help and you didn't do it. And after that, their faces dropped. Like they knew that I wasn't going to stop because they're trying to make me stop there. I was like, no, I said, nothing's going to be, no, I'm not going to stop. I, and then I would get, uh, I knew that I had to keep on because the CEOs would kept on coming to my food slot and they would try and, um, they would try and antagonize me and manipulate me and say stuff to me. And I mean, like I'd be sitting there because I was like weak at the time and, they would they always they would come whisper your voice will never be heard your voices will never be heard that's what they told me and uh we were like okay all right um well thank you thank you for telling us that and like we never I, we did it respectfully like we didn't cuss we didn't do anything and you know after after being in there for that um for the hunger strike we noticed that all the white shirts were coming in like the um what are they called the team leaders they were all coming in and it felt very scary for us because we thought we thought we were being targeted. Like um, it felt like they were shredding documents or something like <laughs> that's how it felt. And and we knew we had to keep on like they were hiding the like because you get apples and bread in there. They were uh, making sure that there was none left out like so that we wouldn't sneak it or anything. And they were making like this is good bread and good apples. And like even though we were hungry, they were like throwing it in the garbage. So. We knew it was, we had a real fight in our hands and we, um, the women in there that were crying, they're like, um, I noticed that they were, they were going like this to us every time, every time they walked, they were going like, like when we walked to the medical, uh, to get weighed in and the, get checked for the doctor, they were, they were doing that to us. And they said, um, thank you for speaking up for us because we were too scared to, and I knew, I knew, I knew that they were scared because I seen, I seen how they were there. Everybody's medicated up there's no mental health. There's no, we, we don't even know what mental health is. I really didn't know what mental health was until I got in there. And I'm like, wow, am I, I'm crazy. <laughs> I feel like I'm going crazy because there was no help whatsoever. I wasn't allowed to see the elders. I kept, they took away our request slips. We didn't even, they gave us the one ply one. We, they didn't allow us, like you had to have a really valid reason just to get a request slip. And uh, I started reading the policy books. I started reading everything. And I was like, Hey, they're they're doing us dirty they're really doing us dirty they're not allowing us to do things that we're actually allowed to have and that's on them because that's not fair and so I started raising that raising that concern I, I think on the fourth or fifth week of the hunger strike they um they started to bring the request slips out and they started to like um after being antagonized and strip searched and the drug dogs constantly coming in um they started to bring the request slips in and they would meet us like every single week and they would ask us if we we're going to stop. And we said, no, because there's too many people that had died. There's too many people across Canada, United States, all over. I said, people, prisons, you don't, you, you don't lose your rights as a human just because you go to prison. Everybody's innocent until proven guilty. That's what we, that's what we told them. And um, they didn't like it. They did not like it whatsoever. And especially being an indigenous, like, look, I have lots of tattoos and they didn't, they, they would like try to snub me off. I was out. I was segregated from everybody. They took away my phone time. They took away my yard time. They took away all my um my uh my cups, my utensils. So at that point in time, I just knew I'm just gonna keep on going. I said, nope. I said my ancestors suffered. They told my ancestors to eat grass, and you know when they suffered, they suffered lots. And so I remember drinking water, like cupping water, like with my hand just to get water because it was co around COVID time too. So we couldn't share, but I would try, I would say, Hey, can you guys leave like an old, like an old noodle, like an old noodle bowl just so I could use it just to get water. And, you know, even with the medical, like I knew I had to say, speak up for the medical because I was uh, maybe four. I said, I told the doctor I couldn't sleep. I wanted like, maybe they had more knowledge than me, like to help me, like maybe with meditation or help me like understand but they gave me 500 milligrams in the morning of epivol and 500 milligrams of epivol in the in the evening and I told the doctor I said hey listen I don't have food in my body I said how is this going to be how is how is this going to be helpful for me and he did not listen to me whatsoever so I was on risperidone trazodone and epivol and I said I told the, I told the other girls I said I'm going to take this for a week and I'm going to prove to you that they don't care they don't care about us whatsoever. After that whole week, I was sent to the hospital. My heart, something happened to my heart. And I told him, I was like, I, I couldn't stand up. I got rushed to the, um, I went to go see the doctor. And he said, how come you can't stand up? I said, because I'm sick. I said, you gave me medication. And you know that I don't have food in my body. And it's affecting me. And um, 
he just looked at me and my blood pressure dropped, like, like drastically dropped. And they rushed me to the hospital and uh, they rehydrated me and they said, are you going to stop? I said, no, you, you, I'm not going to stop because I see, I see what you're doing to our, like to our people. You, I see what you're doing to the people. I said, no, I'm not going to stop in there. So they kept me 24 seven and um, segregated from everybody. I thought I was going to go crazy because I was in a mock cell and in that mock cell, there's a camera on me 24 seven. And I had no contact with nobody. I was locked up for 26 hours a day. And they would say, oh, we forgot you. And I was like, okay, keep on forgetting me then. And then uh, I noticed that after we got media attention, that they started um, they started realizing, you know, this is real. The, you know, what's, what's going on inside Pine Grove is actually being heard out there, that the people are really listening to these women's voices. And I noticed things started to change. And I, I still put in request slips for my water bottle because I was thirsty. I, I didn't want to go because I programmed with my unit still. And I was like, I want my water bottle, please. I, that's all I live on. And they, I finally, after like two weeks of putting my request slip in, the team leader finally agreed to give me my um, water bottle. And uh, after that, you know, I, I noticed I noticed things started to change for me around me. But I noticed that in, in the jail, they put me, they, they kept me separated from where the other girls were suffering, but I still knew that they were suffering. So I said, no, they're still suffering because I knew the other girls on each unit. And I said, no, they're still suffering. I know that they're still suffering. I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up on anybody. I'm not going to stop anything. And so that's what made me want to speak up more. And we, us, us, we, we all band together. Like one of the girls had vitamins. So we know we needed vitamins. So we started taking vitamins. We started, we started, you know, helping each other, you know, praying together because we didn't have anything. We didn't have anything to hold on to because, they weren't letting us see the like the chaplain was there, but she wouldn't come see us because we were all put in high security. And um, there was a mass move for the hunger strike. So they they moved. I think there was 10 of us. They moved to a different to a high security unit and uh, we couldn't see the elder. And after our media attention, then we finally got to see the elder. We finally got to see like, you know, they they finally came to us because they were in that was infringement on our cultural rights. So they know say so we started to read the law. I told the girls, I said, hey, come on, you guys, we gotta start learning for ourselves because you know, we're mothers. Some of us are grandmothers. I said, We're mothers, aunties. I said, We gotta start we gotta start doing something together. So the other girls, you know, they would get faint. They would uh I said, if you have to eat, eat. I said, but and if you want to come back on, I said, you're welcome. So some of them would, would eat and they're like, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to come back. So we did that together. We all raised our voices together and we weren't going to stop for anybody. We weren't going to stop for Pine Grove staff. We weren't going to stop, stop for them, how they strip searched us, how they humiliated us. We weren't going to stop for anything. I said, no, we're going to keep on going, you girls. If you have to eat, do it. And then my daughter joined Cause I was incarcerated, I was incarcerated with my daughter and I, and she goes, mom, I know how to, I, I got you, mom. I said, we're going to do this. I said, all right. And so we just, we just kept on banding together. And I said, you guys are women. I said, we're in here because of we, we, we have intergenerational trauma. Some of our parents have been residential schools, like my mother, like uh, day schools, my father in an orphanage. I come, I come to Canada. I'm from a different country. I said, we're still human beings. I said, we're still women. We can, we can get out of this. There's no, I said, our, our lives matter. I said, no matter what, we can turn our lives around, no matter what kind of life that we led before we got in jail. We just got to get to know who we are as people, as individuals. So that's what we started to do. We started to, to work together, fight for each other and keep on. And you know, the girls, their soul, oh my gosh. It was hard leaving them, but when I walked out on my third trial and um, I thought I was going to go back to jail, I told my daughter, I was like, I'm coming back. I will, we'll play cards as soon as I come back. And on my third trial, when I walked out, I was in disbelief and I made it. I'm here. So I'm just going to keep on raising our voices, their voices, all of our voices and keep fighting together. Thank you, Faith. Um, so, yeah. And I yeah. Two, I just want, I mean, obviously, I hope everybody is hearing about these kind of conditions that when you can't get clean water and the state is responsible for your well-being and can't even get you clean water, as you said, which is also the case on reserves and many indigenous communities yeah. eating that. But um the lack of health care, the um just the disregard of even their own processes. So even the basic things they have in place, like 
the amount of forms you have to file to get basic health care, the fact that they're not yeah. their medication. But I also just really wanted to thank you for um, talking about the kind of solidarity that exists inside uh, the care that the women have for each other. Um, so yeah. I mean, as horrible as this story is, um, it's really beautiful how you talked about the way that you all found voices together and you found the courage to stand up and the care you have for yeah. each other. Thank you so much for sharing that with You're us. You're welcome. Um, you're welcome people can support you get in touch with you like do you have like a venmo i don't know is there anything uh, you said you know i know you just recently got out um where where can people get in contact with you to keep up with your work and maybe support that work as well um do you want to speak um to yeah um i am on facebook faith at uh, faith eagle and tiktok but the most the way you can get a hold of me is through sherry gordon i'm really close with her she is still my good friend and i still communicate with her all the time so if anybody needs to get a hold of me, it's usually through her. So that's that's how we uh, coordinate with each other. Okay. Um, and we have a couple of minutes left. I know you said you're continuing to do this work. So um, what do you, I mean, you've obviously, from the hunger strike, from getting the media interested in this, um, now that you're out, I know that's a difficult thing. Like a lot of people think, oh, you got out, like it's over, but it's not over. Um, so what what, moving forward, like what what do you need what are you working on how are you continuing this advocacy and again like can we support it in some way yeah well right now um we're just uh we're raising the, like the ombudsman like how much complaints that we put in i just i just talked with the, i just talk, had a conversation with them i think it was last week and i told them my experience in jail and my daughter like i'm and the girls like we're we're encouraging the girls to you know step forward and call there and right now i just got a right i got a call from uh, SAS human rights so the government has a reply with for me and I'm not gonna stop there I don't I don't I'm not gonna stop there I gotta keep on going I even for the men because the men are suffering they you know you get there's some of them are still sitting in segregation after like a year like my partner sitting there a year my daughter's still in there so I'm not gonna stop I I usually call in and tell them like the um the directors hey listen how are our people in there? I'm here and I'm listening and I know what's going on inside. Inside, are they getting medical help? So I noticed that when I do call in, they do get their medical help. And I keep on, I, I'm persistent. I told them I'm, I'm going to be persistent. These are people and their lives matter. Thank you. Thank so that's what I do. Thank you. Um, and so, again, for somebody who had to go on hunger strike for months to come out and still be advocating and still not just leaving that behind but continuing to care for those inside we thank you for that um so i think we have sherry on the show later if people want to get in touch i know um faith isn't saying it but you know even sending 20 bucks to somebody for their canteen can be a big help when people can't get the kind of food yeah. they need. so um if people want to get in contact with sherry gordon um if you have some extra resources, I know that times are tough for everybody, but even a few dollars here and there so somebody can get like bottled water at canteen instead of having to yeah. get some noodles or something is really helpful. So um Yeah, it is. You can follow Faith Eagle on TikTok, on Faith on Face Facebook, on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Uh, work. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing that. Um we really, really honor you today. Um your like your work is tremendous. Um, and I know you. the torture that you've been through to come here and have the courage to speak with us today. We so appreciate that. So we really honor you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You mean a lot. <laughs> uh, so we, that was Faith Eagle speaking to us. And again, um, just you've heard about the work that Faith was doing inside that these women put their bodies literally on the line to fight for basic conditions. So, you know, we can also on the outside speak up so i really encourage us to follow faith yes. follow sherry yep. Gordon, and continue to fight for justice for those inside saskatchewan um we actually are joined with fallon now as well i don't faith you can stay you can go i don't know if you want to okay stay. um thank you so much we're gonna move to our next interview so uh yeah you know, have fallon uh abby i hope i'm saying that correctly fallon um, so they were also recently released from prison and they are now joining us as well. Um, so Fallon, again, in your own words, could you introduce yourself with whatever you want us to know about um, why you're here, who you are, and the work you've been doing? 
Hopefully you can hear me. Oh, you're on mute. Do, you, do we have you? Um, I'm not getting audio from Fallon, so I'm not sure what's, oh, there we are. Hello, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you hear me now? I'm not hearing you. Justin, I'm not sure what's... Yeah, and while we wait for uh, Fallon just to sort out the, the, the muting, unmuting stuff, uh, just a reminder to folks that you can um, see or you can read uh, what's being said uh, via closed captioning using the CC function on uh, Facebook. And also, if you go to Facebook Live, if you're there now, uh, plugging in, there's folks having chat. Uh, but also we'll be plugging in uh, the links that Elle has been talking about throughout the broadcast um, here. Okay, and now we have, uh, we have you. sound. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, no, don't be sorry at all. Um, it happens. This is live, live broadcast with like no tech support. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Could you please introduce yourself to everybody that's watching, however you want to introduce yourself and what has the work that you do and why you're here today. Uh, thank you. Well, my name is Fallon Vanessa Lynn Hobby. I am a trans woman who spent uh, time in both the men's and the women's system. I was actually fortunate to be the very first pre-op trans woman in Canada to transfer from the men's to the women's sector. Uh, 65 years old, um, have 22 years of lived experience and I've seen an awful lot of things happen inside the carceral system that is devoid of what would be considered even sensible. Um, prison officials nowadays tend to want to run a penal colony rather than a rehabilitative structured environment. I've been doing advocacy work for 25 years, pretty much. Uh, Professor Michael Jackson from University of British Columbia was my mentor and an amazing human being and a wealth of information. Uh, probably one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. So he led me into uh, a path where I could advocate for others, to help others help themselves. <clears throat> and in the 22 years that I've been in, uh, apart from working for 12 of those years to, to get to the women's sector, um, where I should have been to begin with, I uh, became very efficient at um, assisting at parole hearings, institutional courts, all that kind of stuff. And it created this additional appetite to want to really take a bite out of the big dog for a change. And um, post-2017, after the David and Goliath story is the way I put it, I, I'm ready to take on the correctional system at every capacity. And at the current moment, I'm working to improve the uh, conditions of living in the women's prison in Abbotsford. Um, striving to get accessible washrooms in all the houses to make sure there's railings on the hills so people aren't falling down and getting hurt, uh, which has been an ongoing theme all the time that I was there. And that includes staff, of course. The Pathways uh, Indigenous Cultural Treatment House was uh, without uh, facilities that would accommodate people with mobility issues and or disabilities. Uh, it was an application barrier. And of course, that's what launched the fight for me in that regard. Uh, you're going to exclude Indigenous peoples who are ill or old uh, from a treatment plan is not acceptable. The Pathways House is on the highest hill in the yard, so it makes it difficult for everyone to get there. And I can appreciate that the journey to recovery is a challenge and it's uphill both ways. But you have to have that human factor in there. You have to be able to address what people's needs are and treat them with dignity and respect. And if they can't participate, you're removing dignity, you're removing autonomy, you really trashed all the respect that they could possibly have in that regard. So that's kind of what I've been doing, I guess. Um, enjoying every minute of it, what can I say? I, I really enjoyed the previous speaker. Um, I've had the enormous opportunity, I think, to communicate with her through mail one time. I heard of her story in Saskatchewan. God, she's a hero. I love that woman. <laughs> well, you are also a hero, and thank you for joining yeah. us as well. You've spoken a little bit. I know it's not the entirety of your work, so I don't want to only focus on no. this, but you have spoken about um, conditions, particularly for incarcerated people who are transitioning, and I wanted to, or or who are not 
um, fitting into like CSC's gender model. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that to us, um, the conditions that particularly face transgender and non-gender conforming uh, incarcerated people. Well, my experience, of course, <clears throat> was grassroots uh, in terms of, I mean, there are a lot of people that went through uh, a lot worse than what I experienced in the time that I was in. And, and I know some of those individuals and I, and I feel for them. Fortunately, though, their suffering has led to other people's encouraged or uh, courage, pardon me, to stand up and take action. In, in my case, coming out in what I classified as the most dangerous place on the planet inside of a federal prison, I, I had lived my life as a girl, woman, everything outside, but in a prison environment changes everything, right? Um, so there are no services at all for anyone who is trans. You have to start by seeing a psychologist and, and then they're iffy and humming and hawing about your feminine products, deodorants and, and things like that. And so everything I did, I had to do with a grievance and then we be downgraded to a complaint, and then bump back up to national headquarters. And, and as I speak to you right now, I have three complaints at the tribunal level with one more mediation to go in on the 19th and 20th, hoping it closes, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I, I don't see CSC doing the right thing. Um, I've always given them the opportunity to do the right thing at the front end and brought the concerns there then, you know, the transitioning in prison and, and not having those safety nets and safeguards to help you move through the red tape and the bureaucracy and just to get to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and go through all of that, which is no longer required, apparently, um, it, it is arduous, and it's painful, and it just rips your guts apart, you know. But you have to find your soul, and, and once you find that, you can stand up against any force, the, all of it. So... <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I do just want to say that, and I said this also, as well to Faith, but at the same time as the conditions that you're raising, I think anybody who's listening to these conditions who isn't, I don't want to say shocked because we should know that they happen, but who isn't wounded to their core that this is happening. Um, but at the same time, we're also hearing these tremendous stories of humanity, of solidarity, of the kind of uh, work that we see people doing, the courage. So that's just so <clears throat> Um, you know, we're not just here to sort of give a, a, a laundry list of the worst things that ever happened. And then everyone goes, oh, that's terrible. We need to understand that people inside prison are constantly working to change those conditions and constantly working on behalf of each other at great, great risk to yourselves um, in order to improve those conditions. So that's also a day where we honor them. Um, we are obviously here on Prisoner Justice Day. In the time that we have left, um, what would you like people to know about what needs to be continued to be done in our prison system? You've told us some of the conditions. How do we resist that? Uh, how do you see us continuing to fight the prison system? And where would you like people to put their energies for action? We really need to get the message to society generally that the archaic process that they're relying on now is damaging people and it's not helping people. If they want to reduce crime in Canada, they need to humanize the, the prison system to teach people that there is reward for good behavior, that there's opportunity that will be presented. We need partnerships with communities. We know that the relationship between crime and uh, criminals and victims creates this inseparable partnership. Society suffers, everyone suffers. Someone goes to prison, their family suffers as well. And, and we're hard pressed to acknowledge the overall suffering. We want to support the victims and rightfully so and, and and i believe in that to the very core of my being but we're forgetting that there's children and there's grandchildren and there are moms and grandparents and everyone else who are left behind on the offender side of it and i despise that word but it's the only word that society understands to connect the two so for those that are watching those individuals that are living in a prison are gonna come out hurt and damaged. It's not a place where you can recover emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually, unless you're given the opportunity to do so. Society needs to say, we want them to recover. We want them to heal. We want them back. They're our sons, our daughters, our sisters, so on. We want them back. Thank you. Um, where can people get in touch with you if they want to follow your work, support your work, or just keep up with what you're doing? So I am on Facebook, um, but I'm in the process of setting up 
I, I want to set up a little website um, for two reasons. Number one, I want to continue working with the prison system, which I do. I still advocate for women and men on the inside. And in fact, I have multiple files open right now on both sides. But the men and women that are in the community and doing the work through lived experience and creating apps and, and solutions and platforms for people who come out to make it, to show society that they're not the sum of what brought them to prison. They are the sum of the support we're going to give them on the outside. And they will become what they were meant to be if we give them the opportunity. And that's where I'm at. I want to create opportunity. I want to kick the wheels off CSC, tear down the walls, rebuild it. And with you and everyone else and Justin and all the amazing people that I've been watching today, we're going to do it. Thank you. We don't need prisons. Thank you. And um, this is so <laughs> inspiring, just what you've been saying. I think, again, today we've just seen so many people being through so many horrors and torture come on here and show us the depths of courage and strength and humanity. And you've brought that to us as well. So thank you. Um, please follow Fallon on Facebook and keep up with her work. And thank you so much for joining us today. My absolute pleasure. Really? Thank you for the inviting me. It's been my honor. Um, my heart goes out to everyone today for all reasons. Okay. Thank you. All my relations. Um, we really, really thank you for joining us today. And I just want to emphasize that people are joining us who have like just got out of prison, who are giving their time onto this broadcast because they know it's important to advocate for those still inside. So we're seeing the kind of community that incarcerated people are joining us on this day. And so as we've been talking to people who have uh, been liberated, who have liberated themselves, we know that so many people cannot join us today because they are still inside. And we're going to take some time now to share some messages from people behind the walls. I'm going to start with some messages from women at Nova Institution, which is the prison in my region, in the Atlantic region. Today, they held a gathering and event um, with, I know Elizabeth Fry uh, did uh, the, like organize an event where they learned more about Prisoner Justice Day and we have words from the women. So I'm going to share um, what they wrote. So these are all, from directly inside Nova. Um, so Ren writes to Melissa Duquette. Melissa, I will miss you. We did some pen time together. We were always hanging out together on the inside roomy too. We got along even when we didn't on the outside. It hurt my heart hearing your name on the news. So that is a tribute to um, one of the many, one of the over 2000 people who have died in custody in this uh, country. Uh, and the next message says, Shauna Wolf, I have never forgotten the look on your face when I last seen you. I hope you found your way. Sorry I didn't help you. Saul Laliberti, I miss the way you would check on me knowing we both struggled with our mental health. I'm sorry that you died in that cell. You'll be remembered and not forgotten. Love a caring friend. Our next message says, To all who went to a better place, just remember everyone will miss and remember your face and never take your place. May you rest in peace and be forever happy and not sad. For people will have your back and honor your memory. Um, the next message is from uh, Jen Bowser. On this important day, when we all remember how much you, Natasha, Bonnie, Karen, and Letitia, we are so very loved and how, and how you will forever be missed and cherished. You are all so amazing with real spirit, and I love you all dearly. And I want to say I also um, had spoken with Letitia, um, and so I, I echo that. So that's a message from Jen to Natasha, Bonnie, Karen, and Letitia. The next message is a witness to names. RIP Jennifer Pitcher, RIP Sean Huff, R.I.P. Carmen Piercy, R.I.P. Lynn Husbands, R.I.P. Laita Sparks. The next message is from De uh, Devin Gray. R.I.P. to my Aunt Bonnie Welsh, who I love and miss very much. R.I.P. one of my good friends on the outs, Letitia Beals, love and miss you as well. You guys are truly I miss everybody. 
Love your best friend and your nephew, Devon Gray. The next message says, rest in peace to all the women and men who have lost their lives while incarcerated. They deserved better. The next message, Thomas Gregg as a youth in NY, MBYCC was convicted, that's uh, New Brunswick Youth uh, Facility, was convicted and made to serve four months. In that time, he met Ashley Smith. They became the best of friends and had each other's back. They both went through a horrific, horrendous time in those years. He got nine years out of those four months. The death of poor Ashley and the torture of Tom still surviving, they went through changed the youth justice system forever. So for Tom, he misses and loves you, Ashley. You will always be his garden angel and best friend forever. And if people don't know who Ashley Smith is, Ashley Smith was incarcerated as a youth for throwing apples at her probation officer, was held in solitary confinement as a youth, moved multiple times to multiple prisons every 30 days in order to evade the laws that said somebody could only be held in solitary confinement for 30 days. Um, there are horrific videos online of her torture at various times during that transport. She died inside of GVI um, because the guards did not go inside her cell while she was had sheets wrapped around her neck for 45 minutes um, because they claimed that she was violent and that she was only doing these things for attention. So she uh, was killed by neglect inside GVI. Um, that death was covered up. It took seven years for her family to get justice. Her mother, Coralie, only recently passed, Coralie Smith. And so I also want to honor Coralie, Ashley Smith's mother, who has fought relentlessly for Ashley's justice for Ashley Smith and for the justice for people held in women's prisons across this country. Um, were it not for her fight over many, many years, uh, we would not have had justice for Ashley and uh, the attention that that brought. So I also want to say uh, honor and love and rest in peace to Coralie as well as to Ashley. Our next message is from Kylie. Rest in peace, Mikey Mitchell, Prisoners Justice Day 2024. And then from Nancy Cloud, RIP to all that were ignored in the system. From Richie King, Prisoner Justice Day 2024, you will be missed. Rest in paradise, XOXO. The next message, shout out to Sean Shea and all the boys in Drumheller who are currently stuck in a heat wave and protesting. Stay strong, boys. So again, think about the conditions, how hot it's been, how hard it has been to sleep. I'm sitting here, it's not even that hot right now, but it's still humid. And I'm sitting here sweating, doing this broadcast. Imagine being in a cell, no air circulation, no air conditioning. Um, maybe you have a fan, maybe you didn't have a chance to get one. Um, it's absolutely torturous conditions. And so um, as climate change happens, that is also a prison issue. So if you care about environmental justice, you should also care about prisoners who become victimized by those same conditions. This next message says, in honor of Jay Barnaby and Peter Paul, we miss you, our native brothers. Peter Paul died inside a uh, provincial prison inside in, in Nova Scotia, inside the jail. And as usual, his family did not get any information. Um, they've continued to fight for information and justice for Peter Paul. The next message, I watched Sarah Denny die. I watched her get sicker and sicker and other inmates and I begged for medical attention. I watched nurses refuse to provide health care for a human being for no other reasons other than that she was indigenous and she was incarcerated. The prison system in Nova Scotia killed Sarah Denny. And that's from Marlene Albrecht. Sarah Denny was an indigenous woman who was in an abusive relationship and instead of getting help was sent to jail and then um, had COVID as well as other chronic illnesses. And rather than getting medical attention, despite having chronic illness when she was brought in and needing medical attention over many, many days, she did not receive that attention and died inside Burnside Prison where there have been five deaths, I believe, of six in the last uh, six months. This next message says, shout out to all my friends across Canada that are locked up and fighting for our rights. Keep your heads up and don't stop fighting. Much love from Liz Marslin and Corinne Heffernan. I also want to acknowledge that um, we are sharing names because the women who wrote these messages have asked for their names to be shared and that takes an act of courage um, to say their names on this broadcast on a day 
where as we've heard from so many of our speakers, those who speak out and fight for justice receive retaliation. They get put in solitary, they get harassed. There's all kinds of consequences that come for speaking up. So this is the kind of courage we're seeing from incarcerated people um, that are putting their names to these statements. The next message says, Peter, Paul, we miss you, little brother. Love and rest in peace. Next message, we miss you, Letitia Beals, Sarah Denny, Scott Fish. You will never be forgotten. Rest in peace. So we're hearing a lot of names there. So I just want us again to acknowledge um, those messages from the woman in Nova. And those are only some of the names of the many uh, people who have died in custody. So that's just some we've heard from the 2100 and more names. Um, so I want to acknowledge now the deaths of those who have died in the last uh, year in Nova Scotia, the last year and a half. Uh, so on January 28th, 2023, Peter Paul, a 27 year old two spirit individual from Eskasoni First Nation died at Cape Breton Correctional Facility reportedly by suicide. On March 26, 2023, Sarah Rose Denny, a 36-year-old woman from Eskasoni First Nation, died in hospital after being transferred from Central Nova Scotia facility, Burnside Jail, due to complications from pneumonia. On October 9, 2023, a person whose identity has not been publicly disclosed died at Burnside Jail. On January 17, 2024, Richard Murray, a 60-year-old man from Antigonish, died apparently by suicide at the Burnside Jail after multiple calls for mental health support. On April 2024, 33-year-old Christopher Young died apparently by suicide after having been found unresponsive in their cell at the Burnside Jail. They then succumbed to their injuries in hospital later that day. On June 4th, 2024, another person whose identity has not been publicly disclosed was found unresponsive in their cell, the Burnside Jail, and pronounced deceased at the scene. And Sarah, uh, Sheila Wildman, one of the co-chairs of East Coast Prison Justice Society, says that continuing institution-wide lockdowns at Burnside Jail mean intolerable, intolerable solitary confinement has become business as usual across the entire facility. As a result, prisoners lack access to the most basic legal health and community supports. A Nova Scotia court ruled in January that staffing shortages cannot be used as an excuse for ongoing jail lockdowns. Um, and judges have actually declared this treatment cruel and unusual. So we just want to draw attention to those conditions as well. Um, Justin, I'm going to turn it over to you to read our other statement, which is from an incarcerated indigenous man at Barden Institution, if you're with us. Yeah, I'm here. So again, uh, as I'll just mentioned, this is a statement from a young Indigenous man held in the Barton Jail, also known as the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center, which is located on the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, uh, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. Uh, and he writes, um, Prisoner's Justice Day is an important day because it recognizes the struggles that imprisoned people had to go through for jails to be the way that they are today. But there are a lot of things that could be better. Since 1997, the year I was born, and the year after the last residential school was closed, the rates of Indigenous peoples incarcerated in Canada has increased. The mass incarceration of Indigenous peoples is just another dark chapter in Canada's history. While Indigenous peoples are only 5% of the population, they represent 30% of male federal prisoners and 50% of male federal prisoners held in segregation, uh, today known as structured intervention units. Uh, the numbers look even worse for women with indigenous women representing 95% of women held in segregation. I've been a victim of this. I too have been a victim of this. As I sit here in provincial custody, waiting to prove my innocence, I've been treated as guilty by a racist system that is flawed and is failing me. With the help of prisoner legal supports, I want to help future generations to not go through what I've been through. And Prisoner's Justice Day is one of these important days that gives us imprisoned people a voice to change the future. And um, that's end of the statement. And I'll throw the link for prisoner legal supports into Facebook shortly. Back to you, Elle. Thank you, Justin. And again, thank you to all the incarcerated people who have shared statements on this day. Um, I was tearing up reading the statements from the woman in Nova. 
Um, we're now going to move to our next item. We're coming up to our coverage of the live events across the country, which again, uh, you know, it's a bit touch and go. We we give what we have. Some will be live. We might have some coverage. That's still in process, just so you know. But as we come up to uh, checking in on those events, we're going to talk about a new prison transparency project podcast. And this is actually, I think, the debut of some of that material. Um, so this is an excerpt from a new podcast about life in prison that's called Uncaged. It's brought to you by the Prison Transparency Project, which is an international partnership involving people with lived experience, advocates, academics, and artists working to expose the failures of carceral transparency in Argentina, Spain, and Canada. The host of Uncaged is journalist and Carleton University professor Adrian Harewood, also somebody I know and whose work is very important. Uh, the show's first episode, which is what we're going to hear from, we will hear the story of a former prisoner turned law student who offers an unfiltered account about her experiences living behind bars in Canada. Uncaged will be officially launched later this month and will be made available online. A new episode will be released every month. So you're getting a preview here for Prisoner Justice Day. Uh, Justin is going to cue that up and we're going to take a listen for the next approximately 15 minutes. From the Prison Transparency Project, welcome to Uncaged, a podcast about prison life, where we explore what it means to live behind bars. I'm your host, Adrian Harewood. In our first episode of Uncaged, we hear what it's like to spend time in prison, what it sounds like, what it looks like, what it smells like, what it feels like. Today, we hear Deanna's story. Deanna is in her second year at a Canadian law school and loving it. When she graduates, she wants to become a criminal lawyer. She dreams of doing pro bono work for folks living on the margins, which means she wants to provide free legal aid for people who can't afford it. Going to law school gave her a new lease on life. Today, she has hope. But back in 2005, when she went to jail for the first time in her life, hope was in short supply. Myself. Last call, ring the bell. It's a strange world, strangest still that I'm found oh, here. With... Deanna isn't your typical law student. The 51 year old single mother is older than most of her classmates. She didn't finish ninth grade. She's been poor for most of her adult life. For several years, she was a self-described addict and fed her addiction by working as a sex worker. And Deanna has been to jail more than once. In fact, Deanna has been to jail on so many occasions, she's lost count. She thinks between 10 and 20 times. Her longest stint behind bars was four months. Deanna's prison experience has left its mark on her. It's like nothing you can describe. There are literal iron bars everywhere. You walk into an area that they call uh, admin and discharge and nobody smiles. Everybody is scowling. They take your name, your date of birth and tell you to strip. And so, you know, I did and I'm standing there absolutely naked in front of this officer and she said now turn around and cough and of course <laughs> not realizing that she was like serious I laughed and she said what are you laughing for you look so stupid <laughs> and she said just do what you're told and so I did I turned around and um, bent over, touched my knees, my touched the floor, and coughed. And I remember the absolute humility of it. Nothing, not my sexual abuse as a child, not any kind of relationship that I'd ever been in, nothing that anybody had ever called me brought me as low as that moment when there was a human being behind me staring up into my areas. You began by talking about the fear. You, you said that when you entered, when you entered that, that institution, OCDC, that you were fearful. 
How do you deal with, first of all, that fear? There's never a feeling of safety inside. Although I can say that in times after that, when I had went back in, it was safer than many of the situations that I was in on the outside once time went on. When you're inside, there isn't just fear of the people that you're housed with. The guards themselves is what makes the fear worse because they are there to protect you. They are there to make sure that you hopefully don't die. And I mean that literally. They are nice to anyone. They are never kind in any respect. And often they can be super horrific. Tell me about the lack of privacy and the lack of the lack of space because these cells are not large. So it has a bunk bed and then a toilet and a sink, a tiny desk, and there's like a little bit of space between the bed and the desk that you can put another roll, but I don't know how big that is. Mm -hmm. I know when there's three people in those cells, like there's no getting away from anybody and any kind of a smell or any kind of a noise you definitely hear from your cellmates. Um, and even if you go into the common areas, the shower has two stalls and a bathroom. So even if you're in there to do go to the bathroom, people are showering. If you're in there to have a shower, people are going to the bathroom. So there's never any time that you ever have a moment to yourself. So three people are sharing a five by 10 foot space. How many hours a day were you spending in that cell with the two other people? So again, it was many years ago. At that point, we would have breakfast inside and we would only come out in the evenings. And then in the afternoon, we were able to go to yard sometimes. So what, 20 hours a day? What does it smell like? Just bodily functions. <laughs> it's musty. It's damp often. And then you put people coming off of drugs and vomiting and women on their periods and, you know, put all of that into the mix. Without ventilation, that's what it smells like. But I think the sound is the worst. Like the noise of the guard's shoes on the cement, it's always like squeaky, you know what I mean? And the shaking of the keys as they walk, the muffled voices of the women across the hall, the echoing through the vents, the flushing of the toilets all around you. There's never, and again, even at night, there's not quiet. Like there's never quiet. What was food like? <laughs> inside what did it taste like i'm in law school now and i do a lot of talks um and one of my big things i always talk about is the food inside and i get a lot of horrific feedback from the normies as you would say people who've never been inside because i always talk about like how bad the food is and i don't just mean it tastes bad because you get accustomed to it you look forward to that stuff but I can tell you it's cooked, then frozen, then shipped to wherever, reheated. Sometimes they reheat it again. You know what I'm saying? So it's been reheated so many times that there's no more flavor in it. It's mushy. It's watery. Oftentimes it's flavorless, but it's what you have. And you look forward to the fruits. You look forward to the fruits, <laughs> apples and oranges. It's rarely anything else. I think one time a year you get like when they're in season pears, sometimes a banana, but very rare. But bread, it's mostly carbs. It's mostly bread. They will tell you, oh, it's a balanced meal and it's 3,500 calories a day and it's really high nutritionally valued whatever. But you have to understand that the majority of the people that go in are very underweight. They give them 3,500 calories a day, uh, mostly carbs, mostly breads. 
because they want them to gain weight, to at least look healthier. Um, and then they go out and they say, oh, look, look at that. She looks so much better than when she came in. Really, like we're just eating junk. It's junk. There's no, <laughs> I can't express it enough. I don't have any stats for you or I would tell you, but it's not flavorful. It doesn't have nutrients. The best meals you can get are the kosher ones. Now that's a meal. <laughs> what, was in, what was in a kosher meal? Well, you get real meat. You get real chicken, not processed. So even on the bone, um, you get um, like things that actually look like rice and, <laughs> you know, a potato, <laughs> you know. How do you take care of your body when you're inside? How did you? I mean, you don't. For women, there's no, it's not like you get a ball in the yard or it's not like they give you anything to exercise with. Um, you're eating all of these calories and you're getting maybe 20 minutes of yard a day. So unless you're in your room and exercising, I can remember being in the, in the dorm and there was this girl who had been, she was like a kickboxer on the outside. She would always exercise in the back of the dorm um with her kickboxing moves which was pretty cool to watch but everybody would complain because of the noises because of the movement because of the you know so unless you're in your cell that you have a roommate that doesn't mind people complain about it there's no place really to take care of yourself so unless you're like only eating half of your meals i remember there was a time that i would trade my whatever sweet thing that i got or something off my canteen for people's vegetables, because I was tired of eating all of the junk that they gave me. So I'd be like, well, if you want this like <laughs> mashed up chicken cutlet thing, which has probably 2% chicken in it, I will take your, you know, string beans or whatever, right? How were you able to maintain your relationships with folks on the outside when you were inside? I mean, you don't. Um, so back then, you needed to have a landline. Well, the last time that I was in was around the time that people were mostly only at cell phones. So the Elizabeth Fry Society of Ottawa often goes into Ottawa Carlton Detention Center to help women with release plans or phone calls, different things. So I would get phone calls through them. I mean, for me, it was mostly either calling my lawyer and getting my lawyer to do some kind of message, something, I don't know, you know, or or through Elizabeth Fry. You're in law school. Now, now. yes. <laughs> um, you have contacts. You have a network. Yeah. You are connected to institutions. You're connected to universities. What you know now that the, the, the end of 2005 did not know that you wish she knew well, I wish the Deanna of <laughs> 1993 knew <laughs> that it didn't have to be that way, that I could get an education, that I could come out of the cycle of destruction that my family was all along. And I just wanted that to stop, you know, and, and I know today that it can. I always tell everybody I'm at a really good spot, but I'm constantly tired. And I believe that it's like when you get to a point in your life where you aren't constantly in survival mode, aren't constantly fighting with someone, aren't constantly trying to get the food that you need on your table or pay your bills or, you know, work yourself through, like everything felt like a fight up until probably three years ago. And then there was this period where I just there was this big exhale. It's not that I've arrived, obviously, but it's kind of coming together now. The last time you left prison, what did it feel like when you went through those gates for the last time when you, when you so went for through? For context, um, I remember when I left, I'm just shaking thinking about it. I knew that I would never be back in those walls again. I remember when the door closed behind me and my friend out on the opposite side of the gates and the guard was standing behind me and I remember stopping and looking back. 
And I said, this will be the last time you see me, trust me. And she said to me, sure. And I turned around and I left. And of course I haven't been back. Cool. You've been listening to Deanna's story, the first episode of Uncaged, a podcast about prison life from the Prison Transparency Project, an international research initiative comprised of academics, NGOs, folks with lived experience, artists, and journalists examining carceral transparency in Canada, Argentina, and Spain. For more information on the project, you can go to our website, prisontransparencyproject.com. Technical producer, Dave Sarazen. Co-producer, Don Moore. Original music, Robert Campbell. Robert was recently released from a federal penitentiary. I'm your host, Adrian Harewood. See you next time. I'll stop the fire and send the light. It's a shame, but after you're gone, what? That was uh, one of the episodes of Uncaged, and you can follow that series online. Um, so please keep up with that as it uh, showcases the voices of people who are and have been inside. We're now going to move. And thank you, Adrian, for sharing that with us, um, giving us that look into that podcast and thank you for all your work as well as those in the prison transparency project and we also got to hear some of the music there at the end um we're now going to move we, we have fadi ready with us fadi anab but before we speak to fadi we're going to read a statement um so the statement on palestinian prisoners from prisoner legal support um so i believe justin is going to read us that statement if we have that ready justin all right, folks, and uh, we can see the uh, Instagram post where they uh, put some of this already online. I'll just read this brief statement. And obviously, when we think about Prisoners Justice Day, the first one began in 1975. And since then, it's been observed inside and outside uh, prison walls in Canada, but also across the world. Um, and so it's really important for us to think about uh, how... Um, universal carcerals play out uh, in different parts of the world, um, including uh, parts of the world that are impacted uh, by um, not just the genocidal violence of imprisonment, uh, but also the genocidal violence of war and how those intersect together. So this is a prisoner's legal supports uh, statement on uh, Palestinian prisoners. They go on to say, mm, the Nakba began 76 years ago when more than 750,000 Palestinians were kicked out of their homes and expelled from their indigenous land, and 400 Palestinian vi villages were destroyed. Palestinians have continued to experience substantial violence and expulsion from their native land by the hands of their colonizers, as well as those who support their colonizers, such as Canada's colonial government. Because of the various economic and military agreements between uh, the Canadian and Israeli governments, the two colonial powers are able to profit off each other's exploitation of both the land they colonize and the indigenous people of that land. This includes their attempts to commit systemic genocide, which they do so through various means, such as in incarceration. The United Nations has reported that the Israeli government has imprisoned around 9,500 Palestinians. This number includes hundreds of women and children, along with thousands of men. An article published on Al Jazeera has reported that since October 7th, and I'm quoting here, the Israeli National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir launched his own war against Palestinian political prisoners and deta detainees held in Israeli jails and camps, end quote. This has resulted in the uh, mass, arrest, um, mass arrest campaigns in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, under which the number of Palestinian prisoners has substantially increased. And 7,335 women and 680 children have been arrested. Uh, the United Nations has also noted that the Israeli government has arbitrarily imprisoned an unknown number of Palestinian prisoners from, prisoners from Gaza through, and I quote, a wave of arrest and abduction campaigns. UN experts report that overall, most of those who are imprisoned are being uh, held, and I quote, in secret without even being given a reason for their detention access to a lawyer or effective judicial review. Um, 
Regarding the treatment of Palestinians imprisoned by the Israeli government, UN experts have reported widespread abuse and torture. This includes imprisonment in, I quote, cage-like enclosures in which Palestinians are, and again, quote, tied to beds blindfolded, end quote, and often stripped naked and wearing diapers. Other forms of tar torture and abuse that Palestinian prisoners are currently facing include um, deprivation of health care, food, water, and sleep. Another quote here, electrocutions, including on their genitals, end quote, cigarette burns, having loud music played into their ears until their ears bleed, attacks from dogs, waterboarding, suspension from ceilings, and sexual assault and rape, including gang rape against men and women. And we've heard a lot about that in the news over the past. Actually, I shouldn't say the mainstream news has covered it all that much at all, but we've seen a lot of, of discussion around that uh, in the last week online. The imprisonment and disgustingly inhumane treatment of Palestinians is a continuation of the Israelis uh, government's systemic attempts to commit apartheid and genocide and continue to occupy and exploit Palestinian lands. So thank you for uh, to Prisoner Legal Supports for putting that statement together. And now we'll turn it over to Al and uh, Fadi for uh, further discussing these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And obviously that makes for horrific reading and listening. Um, we also heard from in the interview that we were listening to about the legalized sexual assault that is strip searches. So we know this, this is part of the prison experience, whether it be the legalized strip search by the state, uh, which treats sexual assault as a literal, you know, every day, why are you laughing? This is just part of the process to what we've seen in Israel, which has included riots and protesting in support of the idea that IDF soldiers should be allowed to rape Palestinians, um, where we have rapists on camera who can show their face and come out in public because that is what, you know, enough people support. Um, and so it's very clear that while Canada may not say we do the same thing, there's a, a connection between what happens inside our prison and the techniques of torture. And then at the far end of the scale, what we see happening in Israel and how that is tied to ongoing colonization, domination and genocide. So um, I know Fadi, that's an awful kind of intro for you to have to step into, but we are joined by Fadi Anab from Winnipeg. Um, Fadi also along with uh, being Palestinian and speaking out against um, Israel's genocide and advocating for Palestine also has done a lot of work on things like police in schools, work with Winnipeg Police Calls Harm and working for um, police free schools and also reports on the general policing in Winnipeg. And so we know those connections are very important, recognizing how uh, the genocide against Palestinians is connected to policing techniques here. So welcome to this broadcast, Fadi. Thank you for joining. Hi, El. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for making space uh, to talk about Palestine today. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm honored to be here with everyone. Um, uh, can I uh, start? To talk? Yes, yeah, please, okay. Share, share what you have to share. Okay, thank you. Um, and so uh, as of August 7th, uh, if you go to the Al Damir website, um, we, the total right now is up to 9,900 political prisoners from Gaza and the West Bank are currently in Israeli prisons who suffer inhumane treatment. Um, and this is almost double the number of, from last year. So last year it was 5,200. Um, so just if you're looking at numbers, just the double shows a disproportionality in a way. Um, but we're not just here talking about numbers. We also must remember while we're talking about numbers that there's also other captives, uh, folks who are like in administrative detainees, 3,000 of them. Uh, 250 child prisoners and others, um, but we also have to remember those who are living, um, how captivity erodes communities and weaponizes fascism, Zionism today. Um, and we also have to remember those who are dead, uh, those who die in captivity or in the process of becoming captives. Um, so yeah, when I try to talk about prisoners or captives, I'm trying to refer to all these uh, groups. Um, but the problem is not just numbers, but also our humanity and um, monstrosity, uh, greed and waste that generates, uh, generated by carcerality, capitalism, colonialism. Those are dynamics we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis in Winnipeg. Um, and for some folks, it might be really, uh, uh, 
yeah, why is Palestine related? But we know that police coordinated each other, the military, um, and it's also wasting resources. And it's also when you oppress others, you're oppressing yourselves and your community. So there's lots there to connect. Um, but I want to focus on the uh, Palestinian captives here. Um, many Palestinians in Gaza before October 7th already live in an open air prison. Uh, so it's before October 7th. Uh, they're already a captive population before their official captivity. Um, um, since Israel heightened its genocidal assaults on Palestinians on October 7th, it's not just civilians in the community who are experiencing um, inhumane treatment, but also uh, Palestinians in Israeli prisons and torture camps. Um, recent, recent report, which was just published in August, just earlier this month by B'Tselem, uh, titled Welcome to Hell. Um, uh, and I'm just going to share a quote from that report. Uh, Given the political function of Israel's prison system in a reality of accelerated dehumanization of Palestinians in Israeli discourse, Israel's prison system turned into a network of torture camps, strips of the basic package of rights to which they are entitled under Israeli and international law, as well as other universal rights. So besides torture, which Justin uh, alluded to, uh, and, and, and there's beatings and rape, and there's also the inhumane treatment through systemic malnutrition, dehydration, overcrowding. Uh, so, and those are systemic, it's not accidental. Um, but also like the limited avenues available. Um, so, you know, when you're already struggling under genocide, but you're also under captivity in prison, um, it's also, you know, it compounds those in issues. Uh, so that, that especially after October 7th, the punishment, um, uh, being cut off from the outside world, uh, swiftly denied things like uh, family visits, legal counsel, uh, 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 after long duration that you might get a legal counsel, uh, denying medical, medic, medical care and education. Again, those are issues we're struggling with here in our communities, and they're not new. Um, is it okay if I keep going or if? Bonnie, just please speak, whatever, say whatever you need to say. That's it. Yeah, because yeah. I had some things prepared, especially that also it happened to be an international day uh, for Palestinians earlier this week. And I just want to capture some important messages for the audience. Um, also earlier this month, um, according to the head of the commission of detainees, uh, detainee affairs in Palestine, um, Qaddura Faris, um, Israeli crimes, against the Palestinians did not begin on October 7th, but are a continuation of the systemic process of ethnic cleansing, forced displacement, apartheid that began even before 1948. And I'm quoting him here. Uh, we urge the world to collectively protest Israeli occupation um, and the racist laws, and we can call on governments to uphold their legal duties to prevent such crimes from happening in solidarity with Palestinian political prisoners. Um, the international community sh and should occupy, should hold the occupying power to account by imposing a complete arms embargo on it, applying economic sanctions and suspending its UN membership. To compel Israel to protect civilians according to its obligation as an occupying power. Israel must not be allowed to get away with these horrific crimes. Um, for the general audience, this also means that uh, it's more than asking for a ceasefire because, um, you know, it's a quick catch for people. Yes, of course we need ceasefire, but it's, it's beyond, uh, beyond the, the ceasefire. It also involves ending the Canadian military and financial support of Israel. It means supporting the boycott, divestment and sanctions of Israel, um, rejecting. And this is important, especially for those students, universities, uh, and many settings, rejecting the new Israeli and Zionist McCarthyism that seeks to intimidate, harass, and silence advocacy for justice in Palestine. We must act now. Um, and these are messages, again, by grassroots organizations. I want to conclude also with what Sami Dun, uh, a Palestinian prisoner solidarity network, recently wrote. Uh, we also must fight for the liberation of Palestinian prison prisoners in occupation prisoners and releasing them from everywhere throughout. It's not just about Palestine, but all prisoners. An end to the ongoing Zionist genocide in Gaza in, and in support of the heroic Palestinian and regional resistance 
and for the liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea. Um, on a personal level, when you're talking with, with children, with parents, uh, with loved ones, uh, I mean, yeah, what does it mean, all that liberation and, and, and abolition and dismantling uh, Israeli occupation and Zionism? Um, and, you know, I reflect back on uh, my personal relationship. Um, so if I'm thinking of my uncle here who went to prison and now he passed away, and he would he wasn't he 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 wasn't in he was in Jordan not in Palestine but here you know prisons can be uh, similar in different spaces. Uh, he all as a, as a young boy he coming out of prison he he'll come to me and tell me Fadi, not everyone in prison is a is a professional killer, just like not everyone outside is not a professional criminal. Um, and so it was always this duality is like, look, I'm your uncle, I was in prison, and it doesn't mean I'm a bad person, it's just a bad situation, bad context. Um, and you see in these communities, like, um, even when we're not talking about colonization, we're just talking about poverty and economic situation, those can be crushing on families, and it often leaves you with limited options. Um, and then policing ourselves out of it creates more problems. Um, and so this is issues really, we feel it here in Winnipeg's inner city. Um, um, today, for example, I know I have a bit more time, so I'm gonna talk a bit about this, it's okay. El, yeah, um, uh, today there was a, a marathon from Stony Mountain, Stony Mountain, uh, a bit closer to the downtown. Uh, and you know, many folks don't know where the prison is, don't know how the prison contributes to the economy, don't know how the prison is a process of degradation for the whole community. Um, and it's really like out of your periphery. So how is it to think about Palestinians at this moment? So it's a quite a privilege to think of on Palestinians on stolen land at this moment. So I really need to acknowledge those connections here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, what does it all mean is that we should start asking questions like, how many of those confined in prisons today are really criminals or political prisoners, detainees, captives? How many citizens out there are, again, professional criminals and killers? Questions like these can help us understand that the social justice by and for people demand new definitions, relationships, material conditions, and humanism, uh, recognizing indigenous population, a long history of colonization, uh, and carcerality uh, doesn't help. And again, if, if we have white audiences also who might listen or uh, you know, those who might fit or pass for colonizers or oppressors, we, we also need to recognize that it's not just about those who are prison, but it's also about creating a monsters out of you uh, through your complicity and involvement. Um, so that's why you should also be involved in this issue. Um, and we really need to think of, again, policing in spaces. Um, I live in the downtown. We go to the library, there's policing, uh, metal detectors in the library, um, so that homeless, disadvantaged folks, when they come in, if any metal rings, it's just really a, a, a hassle, and you avoid those spaces for these reasons. But you see now in reports after reports, like Israeli soldiers using carrots and sticks to torture people inside those torture camps. So if a carrot or a stick can become a weapon, um, why are we weaponizing and policing ordinary folks in the community and not focusing on really the real uh, monsters here who are weaponized. Uh, so yeah, I will end, I guess, by saying that we need to abolish policing and imperialism and support indigenous worker alternatives. Uh, we need to connect racial issues with capitalist issues. It's, it's not just about color, but it's also about class. While I'm sitting here, perhaps some of my neighbors are already traveling in Palestine. We need to be con cognizant of these issues. How are how is other people's enslavement part of our freedom? Um, but yeah, it was really an honor to be part of everyone here and listening. Um, Thank you so much, Fadi, for coming on and uh, covering so much ground with us and so much thoughtfulness. Um, do you want to say anything else before we move to our next event? Um, no, I, I'm, 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 I'm really, uh, I just, I, I'd hope, uh, I, I think I'm speaking to the converted in a way, especially of those who might click, but yeah, free, freeing Palestine, uh, don't shy away. Um, and it also, yeah, if you don't care about indigenous peoples in your own backyard, I don't want you to care about Palestinians out there, uh, because that means that you're, you're tainted in your humanity. 
So we need to think about who is in our backyard and also stretch our uh, solidarity to uh, Palestinians and others. But yeah, thank you all for having me. Thank you for joining us, Fadi. Fadi is also a Vanier scholar um, at a PhD student at the University of Manitoba in the Department of Education. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Thank you so much, Fadi, for, for joining us today and for uh, not only drawing our attention to the conditions of prisoners in Palestine, but for making those really important connections and for reminding us that local issues are global and vice versa, and we can't care about one without the other. So thank you so much for joining us on this day. Um, we're now moving, we move very quick in this broadcast. So thank you, Fadi. We're now moving to Cyrus Marcus Ware, a long-term prison abolitionist and activist. Uh, I believe Cyrus has joined us in every iteration of, of this day. I think you've been here with us. Um, so welcome, we're so glad to have you. Cyrus. Um, Cyrus is going to be reading up to us from the children's book, Abolition is Love, which you can see on screen. Uh, Cyrus is the author of this book, and it also features imagery by another, I think we say friend of the show, Alana Fricker, who has long term been in the background of this show doing a lot of um, tech for us in the past as well. Um, so Cyrus is going to be reading this live and Cyrus, you can introduce the book and take whatever time you need. Um, so what we're going to hear from in this particular section is the part of the book that shows uh, PJD event organizing scenes that will be familiar to many of us who have organized these events behind and beyond bars that have taken place this year and every year for the past 49 years. So welcome, Cyrus. I'm going to like go on mute and please feel free to introduce yourself and the book however you please. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Elle, um, and I hope that your Prisoner's Justice Day has been what it needed to be. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. So this, uh, my name is Cyrus Marcus Ware. I'm an artist and an activist um, and a scholar, and I've been um, going to Prisoner's Justice Day events since the, the late 90s and was really captivated by uh, the power of when we make those noises. <clears throat> outside of the Don Dale or wherever we were gathered uh, and let folks inside uh, know. And when we got to hear from folks who had just gotten out who were part of the open mic and just how magical that time of coming together to fight for abolition uh, was. So this book uh, just came out last year and it's uh, set on Prisoner's Justice Day. It's set on August 10th. Um, the main character is learning about abolition and she's really excited because today she's finally old enough to hold her own candle at Prisoner's Justice Day. I'll just start reading this. Today is August 10th, Prisoner's Justice Day. We are getting ready for the rally, painting signs and working on banners. I'm learning about abolition. And there's some familiar artworks in there. <clears throat> These are all created by Alana Fricker. Papa says abolition is love. It's a way of dreaming about the future and making sure that we all get to be free. Daddy says abolition means getting rid of prisons and police and systems that hurt our people like racism and ableism. And they've got a big free them all uh, banner in front and all these folks are getting out from inside and they've taken over the police car. Um, they both say that abolition is how we are gonna get free and what we are going to do together when we are free. And they're bringing some food to their neighbors in tents and they're painting a community mural and the main character is writing to her uncle inside. Abolition is like planting a bunch of seeds and watering them to make sure that they grow. Abolition means love and care and taking care of each other even when we make mistakes. And this little tomato plant has gotten broken in the process of building this community garden and that's okay. So um, they go on to learn a little bit more about abolition they learn about uh, building access and disability justice into their abolition work. They learn about how to you know, tackle when conflict happens, which is always gonna happen in human communities and how we can respond to conflict in a different way. So there's a situation that happens when the main character's annoying cousin comes and knocks over her prized collection of rain balloon bracelets. And then they work through how to assess whether it's a big problem or a small problem and how to turn back towards each other uh, after talking about the problem. So then the main character goes to the jail, uh, visits with Uncle Mark, realizes uh, what her dad says is true, that it is absolutely going to be a better world when no one is inside. 
And then she says at the end of the book, get to hold her own candle for the first time. She says, I get to hold my own candle at Prisoner's Justice Day this year. Papa and Daddy say I'm old enough. Tonight we will read the names of people who have been hurt by prisons and we will promise to meet every year until all prisoners are free. And then, spoiler alert, at the end of the book, Uncle Mark is out and they go to the beach together and sit together with their family. So this is a book for any age, who, you know, any age of person who might want to dream into a, a different kind of future together. Thank you to Alana for these incredible drawings and thanks to all of you for the chance to read this today. Oh, I think you're on mute, Hal. Sorry, I thought I came back off mute. I, I will say all that again. I said, we still have some time with you, so uh, don't run away yet. Uh, first thing is, um, where can people buy this book? I know we're going to put the link up, but let people know where they can purchase this. Yeah, this book is available wherever books are sold. So I would encourage you to support your local Black bookseller. Uh, in Tagorondo, there's a really great place called A Different Book List. Uh, which is in Blackhurst, uh, where you can get this book, but there's Black bookshops all across um, uh, Northern Turtle Island, and I would encourage you to support an independent bookseller. But yeah, you can get this book anywhere that you get books. And you've been um, obviously doing abolition work both on the ground and artistically and politically for a long time. Um, what prompted you to make this into a children's book, to, to do it in this format? Uh, one of the years when we were organizing, so we used to do these organizings uh, for Prisoner Justice Day at the Dawn Jail, um, and then NIMBYism, they moved the jail, you know, they, they, they moved everyone from the Dawn, and it became the health center. So while we were still organizing at the Dawn, I can remember this one year where we had a, a lot of kids, we always had kids, but there was this one year where there's a lot of kids, and they made this beautiful mural it was probably one of my most favorite abolitionist artworks that I've ever seen. And in the middle, it said, I hate jails with a little picture of a cat. And it was like, you know, made by a group of seven year olds. And it was the most profound and beautiful artwork. So I was thinking like, you know, how do we create the kind of conditions where our kids can learn how to respond to conflict and what to do in crisis and what to do when harm happens? in in better ways in new ways in ways that are life affirming that are black affirming that are rooted in disability justice that 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 aren't carceral you know uh, and to have an opportunity to talk to kids about a big idea that isn't really a big idea it's a simple idea we shouldn't put people in cages and we should love each other even when we make mistakes you know this is a you know this is something that we could talk to kids about from a young age uh, and and then you know imagine the kind of futures we could build together so i think you know for me it was just an opportunity also to talk to this other amazing audience of abolitionists young abolitionists you know kids who are like yeah you know i really hated it when you you know took my ice cream but you know maybe we can work out some kind of repair and and they do you know so it's happening on the playground all the time so this book is for any kid in your life who's maybe thinking along these lines already, or maybe a kid who maybe needs to think a little outside of the carceral logic. So that's Abolition is Love, written by Cyrus Marcus Ware, illustrated by Alana Fricker. Uh, Cyrus, before you go, is there anything else you want to take time to talk to us about? Uh, you know, just to say, I'm so thankful uh, for this PJD D TV today. Um, you know, just thinking about, uh, I'm wearing, um, the artwork of Peter Collins. This is from a t-shirt that he made for us, I think 2004, 2005 for PJD. Um, and just thinking about, uh, you know, the incredible artwork and the incredible creative work that's come from folks inside. And for people like Pete, who, you know, the, there was consequences to making political work that supported abolitionist movements. He ended up staying in a lot longer and ultimately died inside. And so, you know, just thinking uh, of Pete, thinking of Eddie Malin, thinking of all of the folks who um, are affected by all of these carceral logics, thinking about you know the war, thinking about Palestine, thinking about Gaza, and just really hoping that, um, yeah, somehow, some way we survive this and we, we come through stronger and freer together. Thank you, Cyrus. Um, I know also probably you can see it right on the shelf. Somewhere behind is also the collection edited by you uh, until we are free. It's sitting oh, yeah. on my shelf. Um, anything else you want to point us to? Resources, books, uh, work that you've done that people can pick up after this broadcast? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Until We Are Free is a great resource because we, we get to talk a little bit about abolition. There's a conversation in there with Giselle Diaz, a longtime uh, Indigenous abolitionist uh, and organizer. Um, that's definitely something to sort of check out. But I think, you know, for me, I'm turning towards the creative, um, you know, practice in this moment um, and thinking about artists who are, you know, talking. I was thinking about Denise Tomaso. I got to see this exhibition of works um, in Halifax and Chibuktuk, uh, and their artworks that are looking at carceral buildings um, and these structures. And Denise uh, Tomaso is a Black artist who's passed away, uh, but who is really, you know, thinking about the effect of the prison industrial complex on Black uh, communities. And so definitely would say to check that out. Um, and then, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a banner library I just found out about, um, and just thinking about some of the incredible artworks that have come out of the last, uh, you know, several decades, uh, and just hoping that people put their hands on the archive. Thank you so much for joining us, Cyrus, and thank you for all your work. You're also a professor at McMaster, correct? Yes, yes. So in addition to everything else, Cyrus is organizing and working in Hamilton so-called Hamilton. Thank you for joining us so much, Cyrus, and for every year that you've joined us here and shared so much. Thanks. Oh, may I say one more thing? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm teaching a class on prison abolition. So if you know any students or scholars who are looking to, you know, dig in at the graduate level, um, there's a class at McMaster. So send me a message. Would love to have you in my class. So that's if anybody wants to take a class with Cyrus. Let Cyrus know. Let's get people in that class so it doesn't get canceled. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is now the part of the show where we start going across the country. There are events ongoing across this country, some of which um, we have footage from, some we don't. Um, some of these ceremonies are very personal and private, um, spiritual ceremonies uh, dealing with you know, people talking really closely around death. So we don't have access to all of these because obviously people don't necessarily want that public. Um, but we know there are ongoing ceremonies and vigils in Montreal, Ottawa. Um, I said earlier in the day, there was an event at Nova in Nova Scotia, but we're now going to move to some materials from Kingston. Um, Kingston is in many ways, the heart of carceral Canada. Um, both uh, the former woman's prison, Kingston Prison for Women, and of course the notorious Kingston Pen um, are slash were in, in Kingston. And so we're going to now move to a message from Rachel and Bobby, both of whom took part in the Prisoner Justice Day Healing Circle at the site of P4W, that's Kingston Prison for Women, um, which was hosted by the P4W Memorial Collective. For those who don't know, the P4W Memorial Collective is a group of former prisoners who are creating a memorial garden to honor those who died at P4W and those who continue to live and die in prisons, jails, and detention centers across the country. In addition to their annual healing circles, the P4W Memorial Collective has organized film screenings, solidarity letters, roundtable discussions, and other gatherings. And I'll also say that they have been, when we say uh, organizing Memorial Garden, that has been a fight against, for example, um, Queen's University used to own the land and then sold it to developers. And then we've had, events such as the developers wanting to maintain the aesthetic of a prison. So, oh, we'll keep the old locks of the doors. And I know Justin has done work on this notion of penal tourism, right? So taking this site where women suffered and tortured and were died, and then selling it to a kind of developer who wants the aesthetic of prison so that you can charge these high prices for people to live there and keep some of the original fixtures. So there's been a fight um, against that kind of private property development and for the recognition of this site and the many women who lived and died within those walls. Um, so we're now going to move to this uh, message from Rachel and Bobby, if Justin has that pulled up, perfect. And I also want to say that, uh, just shout out to Rachel and, and the work that Rachel does, particularly on, which is I think important today, looking at not just the suffering of prisons, but the great resilience and solidarity and the many other things that come out of prisons that we don't always acknowledge and talk about. In talking about the conditions, that can itself become dehumanizing because we just represent everybody as um, a suffering object. And Rachel's work is about uh, recovering and making clear the many other forms of uh, solidarity and engagement and resistance and love and care that take place within those walls as well. So we're gonna to move to this interview now, thank you. Hello, it's pretty, 
Prisoners Justice Day, August 10th, 2024. My name's Rachel. This is my sister, Bobby. We're coming to you from Kingston. Uh, we've had the opportunity to fly a bunch of women from across Canada, different places that did time in the notorious prison for women, P4W, that closed in 2000. And every year they do a healing circle there. Uh, so we had a bunch of events this weekend. Last night we had a blanket ceremony. It's like an adoption ceremony um, for Indigenous peoples. Very special night, ladies. Yeah, it was it was very, very special. Yeah, it was very beautiful ceremony. Um, they're actually filming a documentary, so they filmed some of that along with a really great video at P4W okay. today after we had a healing circle and a sharing circle. There was a film crew that came to the front of the prison and there was like five of us that were chatting along with Senator Kim Pate and Joey Twins talking about uh, the incident in 1994 that led to the Arbor report. Uh, so it was a day of honoring all our sisters, brothers and people that have died behind bars and also remembering the strength of those people who survived. So we'll share when this video is ready. There's a lot of editing to be done because it was like a professional film crew. They have to like, I don't even know. I don't know about technical shit. Anyways, it'll be available tomorrow. So we'll share that online. On you, Bobby. Hey guys, what do I got to say? She said it all. But no, it was a beautiful day and uh, there was a lot of knowledge. There was a lot of honor, respect between everybody and anybody. And I, it, it's a very, very beautiful video, and it will be coming your way. <laughs> we don't like it. Okay. Yeah, solidarity. Hey. There's Justice Day. So thank you to Rachel and Bonnie, and uh, we will have the link up for the videos that they're talking about. And particularly shout out uh, to the woman of P4W Collective. Um, that work is amazing and ongoing, um, not just to commemorate, but to take the memories of those experiences, deaths, the lies between those walls and to continue to build solidarity and work for those behind bars. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Justin, to introduce our next moment in this broadcast. All right, thanks, El. Um, So next uh, we have an interview I did uh, today with another Rachel, uh, the outgoing host of CFRC Prison Radio, uh, which has been doing um, PJD broadcasts in Kingston uh, since, I, I believe, 2009. Um, CR For those who don't know what CFRC Prison Radio is, it, it airs each Wednesday uh, from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time on 101.9 FM in the so-called Kingston, Ontario area and worldwide at cfrc.ca. Um, and their radio signal, interestingly, it extends to um, Brockville, to Belleville, Smith Falls, and Watertown in New York. So um, it does get um, uh, different uh, listenership from inside uh, on both sides of uh, this uh, imaginary border uh, that exists uh, between so-called Canada and the United States. Um, the program features news, interviews, writing, and documentaries about uh, prisoners and prison issues. Um, I, for one, have been interviewed on that show a few times just in relation to my research on prison construction in particular and resisting it. Um, so this time the roles are reversed. I'm interviewing Rachel. Um, so we'll listen to um, mostly her words for the next uh, 15 minutes before we start going to some more event footage across the country. So uh, I'm going to uh, quickly share the screen. You'll see my face again. And uh, here we go. Thank you, Justin. Okay, so um, welcome to uh, Rachel from the Prison Radio Show that's broadcast on CFRC uh, in so-called uh, Kingston. Um, which is the uh, capital of prisons in uh, this this country. Um, and so today you're here to, to talk to us a bit about uh, the work that's been going on in that show since it first broadcast on Prisoners Justice Day in 2009 and started regular broadcasts, I believe, in 2010. Um, and you've been involved since 2017. So 
Um, you have a lot of experience with regards to uh, the show. So what, what have been the main things that, that you've done uh, as a collective and yourself um, with imprisoned people on the other side listening and contributing to the show uh, over the years? Yeah, so I believe the show uh, the show has had pretty much the same format since the beginning, since before I was involved, which is that um, it's on the airwaves uh, one week and one night a week. Um, and three of those nights, three of those weeks are like interviews, analysis, that kind of content, like a news show basically about prison. Um, and then the fourth week has been a, a call-in show. Um, which is a pretty different vibe. Um, so I would say, uh, in terms of your question about involving prisoners, um, during the the newsy sections, I mean, we've interviewed many prisoners and their supporters over the years. Um, people have been on the show in all kinds of different capacities. Um, and also, we hope to sort of just share uh, stories and art and news and ideas um, and just kind of generate conversation about prison and prison abolition and prison issues and all that kind of stuff, um, sort of between people in the Kingston community and people behind the walls also in the Kingston community. Um, the call-in show, uh, which was is called Calls From Home, is a once a month uh, kind of fun broadcast where we take song requests and messages, supportive messages, uh, and put them on the air. So people's, typically prisoners, loved ones call in and send like a, a song and a little message to someone who they're missing on that night. Um, and we would either read that out or play it out depending on how we received it along with their requested song um so obviously that week had kind of more of a party vibe like we'd play everyone's favorite music um but it's just kind of a way to like foster connection i think uh between incarcerated communities on the outside and us and the prisoners who are listening inside can you give us a sense a bit of of like who was listening to the show or who was able to access the show from behind bars in terms of of the reach yeah. that you had during the time you broadcast yeah. So one of the funny things about radio is that like you really can't know exactly your reach. Uh, like there's no like count of your listeners or anything like that the way there would be with a podcast. Um, but we can we can gauge that based on the calls we receive and the people who engage with the show. Um, and over the years, people in all three of the major federal sites surrounding Kingston um, definitely were were tuning in and listening to their songs um, and families and supporters and loved ones of those people were calling us and emailing us. Um, we usually, for the request show, we would get, you know, anywhere between one and like 20 requests for the show per month. So that like really depends on, uh, I guess, just on listenership, you know, like we'd have people who were really into the show for like a number of months or years, but then they would get transferred or move or things like that. Um, so it's been up and down over the years in terms of listenership and engagement. Um, and we really can never say how many people were, were tuning in, but we do know that uh, in some institutions, in some point in time, there'd be like group listening happening. Um, and then also people who have radios in their cells would, would be listening on their own. There'd be no way that we would we would ever know if they were or weren't hearing us. So yeah, it's kind of a complicated question. Unlike with like web-based platforms, uh, you really don't have a, a numerical sense of who's listening. But the, the reach, the broadcast range, um, is like the entire area surrounding Kingston. So anyone who was able to tune in, had access to a radio and knew about the show, uh, could hear us from um, the, the Joyceville Penitentiary site, from the Bath Mill Haven site, from Collins Bay, uh, as well as from Quinty Detention Center, which is the provincial in Napanee, um, and also from Kate Vincent Correctional in upstate New York. And I know that before my time, there actually were like a number of calls for Kate Vincent as well, uh, although that was not happening since, I, since I've been on the air. Okay, very, very cool. And like, do you have a sense of like how um, the, the types of, of issues that folks were most concerned about uh, behind bars in particular, like the, the common things that they, that they were sharing the most uh, with respect to what they want, wanted to change and what they were really affected by? Yeah, man, I mean, it's been a long time, right? So there's like, there's changes year to year about stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, one of our busiest times was during the pandemic. Um, we had like so much listenership and so much engagement during those, those couple of years, people like hoping to just be able to access basic things that had become sort of expected, like visits, like um, like access to communication with the outside at all. Um, we've had lots and lots of talk over the years about, about work and compensation for work um, and like, you know, like prisoner wages, prisoner rights inside their, their like inside and outside workplaces that they do work in. Um, we've had people talking about like access to healthcare inside, uh, the positive healthcare inside, how like, you know, um, 
people who are basically just being killed by the lack of access to healthcare on the inside. That's been like a major theme for sure over the years. Um, yeah, access to like in-person visits, um, family visits, that kind of stuff. And, and it's, a, it's a huge list, food, lots of food service stuff. Um, Cause there's been a lot of changes in that time in terms of like work and food. Like those two things have changed a lot in the years that I've been on the show. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure your listeners like know the list and we've probably heard like little bits of all of it. Um, but every year there's sort of like a couple salient issues that, that come up, you know? Right. And it's not surprising in the context where the daily wage for federal prisoners to uh, work has not changed for, um, I believe, over four decades. And I still think it sits some, somewhere around, I think, $6 a day. And then minus yeah. and board and all the rest. Um, and sometimes that gets was yeah. like during the context of the pandemic and whatnot. Sometimes yeah. it gets massively clawed back, like when Harper was in office and so on and so yeah. forth. Um, but uh, not so I got involved during I got first involved like during the Harper years. Um, like my when I, when I first became a regular host of the show, um, there had been like a wave of of work disruptions about wages and about particularly about room and board being taken away again, even though it was already included in the wage that was already being given. Um, so that was like the first major inside issue that I ever really engaged with on the show. Um, and I still think about I still think about that like that quote unquote wage is basically like no money for doing. Um, real jobs, right? Like I think, you know, people picture all the inside jobs, but there's also people, um, there's people doing all kinds of stuff on the outside for, for different wages, but still like not with the rights that we would have as like workers working in those same workplaces who are not prisoners. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can just talk about, um, uh, is there one moment in particular that sticks out in your mind as you're, um, leaving the show, um, <laughs> and talk about what the future of the show looks like with uh, with um, mm -hmm. whomever's picking it up next. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I do a lot of, I've done a lot of interview work because it's just something that I, I do for other projects as well. But for sure, the call-in show is like the most, has the most impact, I think, on the hosts. Uh, so when I think about memorable moments, I think about like PJD every year. This is the first year I ever have not been doing like a day-long broadcast myself on CFRC. So it's weird to be free at this time even and be talking to you in this direction versus me interviewing you. Um, but uh, but we also do like a holiday special. Um, so we the last Wednesday before Christmas, uh, we would always do like a two hour kind of mini special um, where we would get people to send in their holiday requests. Um, I think like the second year I ever did that, we got like a number of voicemails from children because um, we do this thing where we put out a voicemail line um, and you can just call it and leave your message and then we'll like, we'll play your message and your, the song you requested after it. Um, so I, I have like a really, really clear memory. I wish I could play it for you, but I don't, I don't have it right here. Um, of just like this, this series of calls from these two little kids who wanted to talk to their dad. Um, and like the super, super loving message that they, that they sent along with a request for that, like grandma got run over by a reindeer song. Um, which and maybe is kind of like a joke thing, but like, I just, it was like, it was so, so sweet. Um, and also really sad to think about that, that kind of separation, that level of separation. Uh, like, you know, during a holiday that presumably is important to the, to these little kids. Um, so yeah, that's the thing that I always think about, even though, yeah, I did lot, I did talk to lots of people who were involved in like struggles on the inside that are really important. Also, um, that I have like a lot of favorite moments, but, uh, that's what I always come back to when people ask me that question is that Christmas broadcast every year. Yeah. Really important to underscore one of the principal functions of prisons is to isolate and disappear mm -hmm. people, separate them, uh, from communities and from their loved ones um and yeah. it is really 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 damaging stuff um so to be able to foster that connection through prison radio is uh super important um so what what's next for uh cfrc yeah. prison radio um now that um you're stepping away and and um others are stepping up yeah, so um, I've been on the search for someone to take over the show for a couple months now. Um, I do think I have found a couple people who are going to put a new collective together. Um, I can't really speak exactly to whether the show will have the exact same format, but I do know that at least one of the people involved is like a, an old collective member from before my time. Um, so I feel like it'll be in really great hands. Um, and I think that it'll be back together by sometime in September, maybe not the very beginning of September, just because um, doing the show collectively, uh, while much better and easier and leads to a more vibrant show, also requires like a lot more behind the scenes organizing to kind of coordinate. Mm -hmm. So I think they're just going to need a few weeks to kind of to get that 
get that going and get on the air again. Um, in the meantime, there will be reruns on on the air during that time slot. The reruns are good. Like if you haven't if you haven't been a long time listener of the show, I totally encourage you to still tune in at seven p.m. on Wednesdays because because uh, like we picked good we picked good reruns and they're they're nice like timeless content as well. Um, but once they get back on the air, it'll be totally in their hands. I think it'll probably be a good show. I will listen myself, um, but I can't exactly speak to whether it'll have the exact same format or anything like that. Um, I do know they intend to continue the call-in show, which is, I think, by far the favorite the favorite aspect of, of the show. So there, I can confirm that there will be a Calls from Home and song requests will still get played at some point during the month, for sure. And where can folks uh, get, get access to, to that? So if you are um, if you are a prisoner in the Kingston area or anyone else who prefers to listen via mm -hmm. the actual radio, um, then you just turn your dial to one and one point nine FM on Wednesdays from seven till eight PM. Um, if you are a supporter uh, anywhere else in the world um, or anyone who has access to the internet, I guess anywhere else in the world, you can go to cfrc.ca. Um, you can tune in at that same time live, so 7 p.m. on Wednesdays, if you just go to cfrc.ca and just click play in the top right corner, you'll hear whatever's live on the air. Um, you can also go to that website, dig through the archives, and I believe you can access like the last six weeks of content that way, so you can hear old shows that way. Um, if you want to hear like legacy, like my content, older stuff, um, cfrcprisonradio.wordpress.com. Um, is like the site that has existed since the beginning of the show. Um, and most of the content, most of the original content, but not the call-in show uh, is available there um, all the time. So you don't need to wait till Wednesdays to find it that way. Okay, and we'll throw up those links on the uh, Facebook Live yeah. podcast for PJD TV 2024. So just to finish up, um, mm -hmm. why do you think prison radio programs are important to prison justice and prison abolition organizing? <clears throat> I mean, lots of reasons, right? I mean, like, for one, like most prisoners don't still don't have free access to the internet. Um, so I think uh, radio waves are really, really hard to block. That's been proven in lots and lots of places and lots of different contexts through like pirate radio outside prison through shows like ours. Um, it's just really difficult to control uh, what is said. So while in some ways, it's like a very mediated forum where like only I have access to the microphone, and I'm just kind of talking to you unless you phone. Um, in other ways, it's like a very uh, free way of communicating in a, in a different sense. Because mm -hmm. um, like, uh, if as long as people can still act as little radios, as long as that's something people can purchase and have inside, it's going to be really hard to stop us from communicating in that way, which has allowed us, I think, to have like pretty explicitly abolitionist content over the years and still maintain a listenership inside. Uh, whereas if we did like a, I have worked on like print publications in the past, um, or certainly anything that's like web based, um, that's going to rely a lot more on like permission and mediation, like through the prison system itself. Um, so I think radio is like super, super important for, for prison media, anyone who cares about like prison media, uh, or like longs for like, you know, the older days of the penal press, things like that. I think radio is a super great forum for that kind of like inside outside, uh, dialogue that can be explicitly political. Um, but also can be sort of like live and like, you know, like you're not writing long letters that take a long time to get there. Um, you're not waiting for like a particular volunteer to like bring your message in or like to get approved as that volunteer. Um, you can sort of just have this like kind of conversation, like not a direct conversation, um, but a fun conversation that can be playful and can be radical. Um, and yeah, I think it's really great. I think radio as an aside, um, like I think radio is cool, even if you're not a prisoner. Uh, because people can tune in by mistake. So we've also had uh, over the years, many, many people who just found prison radio because they had CFRC on like in their car on their way home from work and then, and like called in and were like, oh man, like, you know, I have like a brother or a friend or whatever inside. And like, I didn't know about this. And like, this is really cool to hear. Um, whereas most of the media that we as abolitionists create goes, you know, like largely to each other and to the people who are already in our orbits radio can still be really stumbled upon in that way, which I think is like super invaluable and really great. And people should totally continue as they do in many cities to engage with prison radio projects for sure. Okay. Well, thank you for so much for, for sharing your experience with us and the kinds of things that you've um, covered over the years and for all the work that you've done. And um, yeah. Um, thanks so much for taking part in PJD TV 2024. Thanks a lot.
So that was Justin in an interview with Rachel talking about prison radio. And I'm going to put a plug in here for the Black Power Hour, which is a prison radio collective on CKDU 88.1 FM. We're live at 8 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Atlantic time, my time on Wednesdays. Um, you can listen online at ckdu.ca, and that collective includes Israel and Dr. Todd McCallum. So again, that's on ckdu.ca. You can listen live Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, there's also archives to the show online at ckdu.ca. For those in Halifax, that's on 88.1 FM. Um, for those of you just joining our epic and long uh, broadcast, this is our broadcast uh that the Abolition Coalition, which is a collective of different prison justice, prisoner rights, liberation groups across Canada. Um, we do this broadcast every year for the past five years to honor Prisoner Justice Day and to bring you the stories and events that are taking place across this country on this day. Um, this is 50 years since the death of Ed Nalen, who died by suicide inside of Millhaven Institution after uh, being in solitary confinement. Um, and the next year, uh, which was now 49 years ago, on the anniversary of his death, prisoners fasted and went on a work strike in order to draw attention to the conditions of solitary confinement and to honor his death. And that tradition has continued on um, and is commemorated not only inside prisons, but outside prisons and also in solidarity across the world. Um, 1974, which is when, or 75, which is when Prisoner Justice Day began, um, it was also part of a global wave of prison organizing, um, including things like the Attica Uprising, um, so inside New York, uh, California prisons, which included the original BLM, the Black Liberation Movement, um, where people organized on the ground. So we know that abolition, which we speak about, has always been a prisoner-led movement um, by those inside walls. We are also in Black August, which is a month um, chosen by members of BLM. So again, beginning with incarcerated people in California's prison system, um, Black people who chose this month to commemorate um, the many important events in Black liberation. So as opposed to Black History Month, which honors a lot of first, you know, becoming, you know, like first teacher, first president, uh, Black, uh, Black August is about our liberation struggle and recognizing the many um, important liberatory events that have happened globally. So um, the first enslaved people to land in the Virginias were in August. Of course, the Nat Turner uprising was in August, uh, the Sam Sharp rebellion. Um, many Black revolutionaries were born or died in August, including uh, Marcus Garvey, W.B. Du Bois. Um, so many revolutionary events took place in that this month. So Black August was chosen as a month rather than focusing on integration into uh, bourgeois capitalist systems to focus on the work of liberation and to encourage us to um, look to our revolutionary past to continue that work into the future. And so it's also an appropriate month for Prisoner Justice Day to take place in the revolutionary spirit of Black prisoners and all incarcerated people across the world. So shout out to Black August that we also celebrate. And again, remembering this month has been the Haitian Rebellion Revolution, of course, also kicked off in this month. So many, many important global events um, in the liberation of African peoples across the globe took place in this month. We're now hitting the point of the show. I keep saying that, but we are, you know, we've had a lot of uh interviews and taped material. And we're now moving to the part of the show, which can be a bit chaotic, but we are starting to join or at least get footage from or speak to people who have been at vigils, uh, ceremonies and other events across this country as people commemorate and honor Prisoner Justice Day. We are shortly going to be bringing you some footage from Ottawa, which I believe is audio footage um, from the event in Ottawa. We may or may not have some content from Montreal. We may be joined later in the show. Um, again, because this is live, people are finishing their events. So we have something scheduled that we may not get to, but we will try to bring you that event. And then we will be headed to Vancouver to join some of their events live and speak uh, to Menakshi Mano and other people organizing in Vancouver. Justin, are we ready uh, to come to Ottawa yet? Uh, yeah, we're ready. I'm, okay. uh, I'm going to play the audio clip now. And so Someone oh. can confirm on Facebook that they can hear it on the other side. That would be super helpful. So here we go. I'm playing a clip uh, from uh, Farhat Remen uh, from the Moms Mothers Offering Mutual Support. 
um, which is a group of um, women who have uh, loved ones behind bars, either um, uh, sons, daughters, children, um, or um, nieces and nephews, um, or even uh, husbands behind bars, and they they provide support for each other and they advocate. Um, so I'm apology for the lack of image here. I'm going to play the video or the audio, and then uh, we'll move uh, from there to uh, footage from Takaranto, Toronto afterwards, and then we'll sort out the Montreal stuff. All right, here we go. Hi, everyone. So I am a mother of an incarcerated German man, and uh, I'll just give you a diagram of the group that I belong to. Um, but I was one of the original co-founders of Mother Love for Mutual Support. I mean, many of you know of them, but uh, um, we founded this group to be a support group for uh, women who have family members that are incarcerated. And, um, uh, you know, the objective is to support one another, but also we formed an advocacy group for women who were willing to speak out. And uh, so we have an advocacy group, which is so important, uh, we, feel, we feel, because of the uh, conditions of confinement our uh, family members are facing. So they only have, they don't have any voice. So we are their voices. So we needed to have an advocacy group. Um, the personal stories that we hear each month on a monthly um, meeting is that uh, they, there's always the underlying uh, precursor to crime that would be either most in most cases mental illness or addictions, and that uh, they do they have never had enough resources in the community. The the healthcare system lacks that uh, continuous and persistent help that they can get. The programs are very short, and they come to an end, and then the the. Uh, when there is the spiral down to criminality, and that's when really the crisis happens. And such was the case with my son as well. He was, uh, I could, you know, it just seems we're talking about the past, present, and future. For my son, for my son has a life sentence, so it just seems I circled the past, present, and future. And it seems endless that his suffering uh, will, uh, you know, um, uh, stop at any time soon. So the public, you know, the public awareness is such a critical piece in all this that we are talking about. And I'm so encouraged by your presence today. You know, we have this uh, interest and in that you came. So thank you very much. But it is very hard to, you know, to involve uh, this um, correctional uh, systems or the justice system as something of interest to the politicians and the public at large. You know, when have you seen a politician go up and say, I will reform the correctional system? That's not on the radar for anyone. Uh, but, um, you know, you can just imagine, though, why we are involved and why we talk. Just imagine for a second that you have a son or daughter or a family member who's brilliant, who is doing so well in school, and though they've got everything going for them. And uh, they have, uh, you know, they, and you have aspirations for them to excel and do well and uh, all comes uh, you know, point to that, that they are going to do well. But for some reason beyond our control, we just imagine that that loved one that you hold dear and have high expectations for ends up being incarcerated. And everything you have taken for granted to be simple and normal and routine that, you know, you think I'm a Canadian and my son or daughter was born here and I can this is just like a system that I can, you know, I have, I do have, I have rights. But then you find out how the system is 
fraught with uh, you know inconsistencies. You are um, you're you're dealing with anxiety, anger, and despair, and this frustration, and this painless learning curve that you have never imagined possible, or con uh, you're uh, you know you're a contented Canadian citizen, but you will be. It would be a staggering and a desperate way to find help. And uh, so imagine that these scenario, you can just imagine how, what kind of an impact it eventually has. You know, you see them uh, once they get incarcerated and some of our moms have had the remand in the period when they are in there and they're awaiting trial. That remand has become longer and longer in our system, unfortunately. And you will hear, the, I've heard the, the leader of the opposition and our premier for Ontario speak that, oh, they shouldn't be bailed. They should be put in prison. They have no idea what they're talking about when they, they, they don't think for a second that it be fair anyone in their family members that can be subjected if they did to talk for a second they wouldn't be making statements like that so it's that kind of mindset that we have to you know struggle to uh, deal with so most of the time uh, and in one case last year this did happen but green and period was too much to bear for one of our moms and for her son, she kept saying, and she was in a meeting that she told me her son, I don't think, would be able to wait seven months. That was the duration that he would have to sit in jail and await his hearing, the first preliminary hearing. So there was the mother expressed this fear that this is it's not going to, you know, pan out well. And she, her fears proved right. And our whole group was very affected by this. It was like having uh, your own loved one pass away uh, uh, by suicide. So we have had experiences like that, but you know, we um, we advocate and we write letters and we've written opinion pieces and those we hope will make a difference. We can only hope. But you know, when decades pass away and the, that is not a priority, you see by talking to your politicians or by talking to others, that that is not a very sexy subject to broach. So you become very hopeless. But sometimes the situation does get uh, alleviate itself for some um, uh, women and uh, in our group, and they would share a good time story, a good story that we really, you know, lifts us up again and that we can continue. And one such incident happened just last uh, few months ago, where um, one of the sons got uh, parole and he was eligible for parole and he got parole. So the mother would shared it with us and she must have shared her experience with the support group, how she got um, support and strength from being part of the group. So he wrote us a letter. And then amidst all these dire situations we are telling you about the prison system and the conditions they have to uh, uh, face. And this young man, like uh, Eileen's uh, medicine wheel, was at a stage where he is absorbing the good and he's trying to shed the dark and uh, painful that uh, exists. So if you, with your permission, I will just quickly read that uh, letter. And I read it to my son over the phone and he really was uh, very impressed. So here's the letter from Matthew. I'm writing this to give mothers hope and love. If I was with your sons, I would be their friend. Thank you for caring about them as you do. Trust me, when mothers are strong, their sons become even stronger. 
The year was 2019 when my world changed. All hell broke loose, I lost my mind and went to prison. Little did I know then that this would save my life at the time when I thought my life was ending. For a first time offender, a five year sentence can feel like forever. But as time went on, after all the breakdowns, heartache and desperation, I slowly found victory and real friends. Here I stand now, a truly changed man, full of life, love, confidence, and wonder. And my goal is to show others that there is light at the end of the tunnel. My growth, my forgiveness of self, forgiveness of others, and the ability to stay calm through torture of the mind is what got me to this point. Going through the experience of a prison has taught me more about myself than I ever thought possible. The trick is seeing prison not as a place, but as a tool to grow. And when it's time to leave, a second chance at life is the gift that comes. People who surround me in prison can be untrustworthy, but there are diamonds in the rug. All I needed to do was learn the difference. People do care about each other in this place. I badly wish I had calm words for mothers with sons who are here for a long time. I can't imagine your pain, but I will say that from my time here, I found true friends who care for me. I can find that your son can too. If I can find that your son can too, family is what makes it. And here you can choose your family members. Remember, your sons do have good people around them. That is encouraging to you. Keep in mind that nothing lasts forever. One day we will all be free again. Just believe and never stop looking ahead. The best times of your life are yet to come. This is very hopeful and positive. So I ended it with that. But this probably continues. Thank you. So that was. Uh... From Ottawa, we had the audio. And again, I really want to send a huge amount of love to many of the mothers who have to do this work of advocating for their children who were killed inside this country's prison. And we know the incredible trauma of that and also the courage it takes. We're now into the kind of messy part of this podcast. Um, this is where we attempt to join many of the events. So we will be headed to Toronto first, uh, to Toronto. To, um, we have some footage from the events that took place there. Um, just full disclosure, Justin's like literally receiving footage and is behind the scenes trying to desperately cut that footage and can't come on camera while he's doing that. So we're going to be kind of in this frantic stage to bring you this footage right now. So Justin, just give me a thumbs up when you're ready to place, when we're ready to go to, to Toronto. Just yeah, let me know. we're good. Okay, we're good. All right, so we're going to join. Uh, we uh, Is this footage, do you want to set us up, Justin? What are we looking at? Okay, so we have some... Uh, footage taken earlier in this day from the event in Toronto, and we'll just let that play for a moment. Yeah, we're going to listen to uh, three speakers, and at this Prisoner's Justice Day event organized in Takaranto, Toronto, um, there was information booths from local organizations, um, also, I believe, a candlelight vigil, and so we'll tune into three speakers for about uh, 15 minutes, and then we will uh, be on to our next uh, event from there. Okay, so here we go. Same drill. Folks on Facebook want to let me know if they can hear the sound. Uh, let's roll. Thank you. Everybody can hear. Um, I just want to share a little bit of my story right now, but also tying it with what one of our gentlemen just said about the rehabilitation stage. And me, myself, petty crime, heavy time, that's been the theme of my life. And at this stage right now, I completely made a transformation change thing to collective thinking of people that work in social fields that oh, brought that collective easy. thinking and programs to help me get better. And now that I've gotten better, unfortunately, I had strands of addiction and crime that had expanded that I'm still dealing with. And unfortunately, some of my biggest advocates and people that I know today, I met in the prison and in, in jail. So hell. Hell for that matter, sorry. And hell, hell, because we said earlier, prison, whatnot, it's not, it's hell. And 
essentially right now I'm in a transitional stage of my life. I'm at a crossroad. And I, I just got in a pre-sentence report. This pre-sentence report showed my entire criminal career, petty crime, once again, heavy time. And they accumulated everything I've done over the last 23 years of strictly addiction standpoint. You're shaking to try to talk to you about this. And they literally said to me, they want to send me to the penitentiary. The first time in my entire life, I've gotten a job. I've gotten myself together. I'm taking care of my family. I have a daughter. And they literally said to me that everything I have done is not worth it. And that I should be accumulative jail. What do they say when you accumulated, uh, accumulated because of every little thing I've done. Now this big moment of my life where I've accomplished, achieved, and I'm showing, giving back, and taking the care from every collective body and agency that's here, and it's not acknowledged. The system is not made for rehabilitation, recorrection in any form of way. It is only meant to incarcerate, punish, and humiliate you. On that note, I want to just highlight my immediate story. I had suffered with, sorry. I have suffered with illiteracy my whole life. I had recently got into school, got myself together, but the whole time I was in jail, these 23 years off and on, once again, very little times, very little hard times. I never once was given tutoring, education, nothing. There is zero, zero, absolutely no chance. Longer time you get, the longer devastation, the longer impact, you will come out to nothing, more nothing. So every collective person that's here and speaking, I hope we get something resolved and this is not the future for somebody else, but I might not be an extreme if I am, God bless. But I am going to say, I thank everybody that's here for collectively putting things together for me to be here and even have a joy to speak about. Thank you for every person here. Three ways up from here, right? Only ways up. Three ways up. One way, one way. Only ways up. Thank you, Wadi. That was yeah. really powerful. I would like to call on our next speaker, Candace Beckford. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out. My name is Candace. Um, I'm 42 years old. Uh, I am a person of, who has been diagnosed with HIV. I am also, um, I would also consider an addict, um, a recovering addict. Um, I also have been out of the prison justice system for about five years. Um, it is so good. Um, when you're going through shit, you don't have to talk. I almost never got to meet you. Uh, and I just want to share my little story with you. Um, I never really grew up with brothers and sisters and stuff like that. You know, I was very sheltered by my, my dad. He really tried to keep me out of, out of trouble and make sure I went to school on time and you know, all that stuff. Um, I ended up wanting to be around people so much that I wanted a friend so much that I started hanging out with the wrong crowd. And then ended up me being involved with people that did crime, drugs, and that and I be in jail. Uh, when I was diagnosed with HIV in 2009, um, I had just gotten raped. I was held hostage for 36 days, beaten and raped. Um, I ended up in jail, and I found out in jail. Yeah. And everybody that claimed they were my friend were really not my friend. That's who you, how I knew who my friends were, because yeah. they were the ones to say, hey, I'll still be there. Nothing will change. And guess what? It was the total opposite up until today. The, the, the guards in that jail in that in Bangay are so terrible. I mean, they would segregate me on purpose, make it look like I did something I didn't do. If I put in a canteen sheet, they throw it out, things like that. And to the point where I had to file more than one human rights complaint 
against the system because don't let that they abuse their authority against every woman. They lock you down for you being black, for you being whatever you are, for you being an addict, and they treat you like you're shit. They yeah. treat you like you're nothing. Okay. And that is not good. Okay. And then but that is but then they expect you to respect them, but they don't respect you. Everybody is their own person. Not the drugs, crime, that, that does not define you as a person. You are your own individual, no matter what. And everybody deserves respect, and everybody should have respect, and everybody should give respect. So my short little story is that I love all of you, and I just want to pray for everybody out there that has passed. Your spirit is here with us today. So let's thank God and pray and say amen. Amen. Thank you, Candace. Um, just listening to like, Candace and uh, Wani speak, it makes me think of a quote. You know, it says, Sometimes we feel like we're being buried, but really we're being planted. You know, sometimes it feels like we're in a hole. Sometimes it feels like people are kicking dirt on us. And in spite of all that, we all have grown. So, congratulations to you, too. Um, I'd like to call on our next speaker, Daquan Northey. Hello, how are you guys doing today? How are you, my friend? All right, all right. Um, I'm 30 years old. I'll start like at the beginning. Um, I was born like in 1994. My mother passed away when I was about three years old. Then my father passed away in like 2001 when I was seven. I had just moved to Canada. Um, when I was 12, I was I found out I was diagnosed with uh, HIV. So. Not to give any excuses for my incarcerations or anything, but I've had it pretty bumpy, you know? I think I've even run into a few people along the way, you know what I'm saying? Good to meet you, of course. And I didn't know how to like, you know, work the system. And I've had to have older men like tell me, you know, don't put yourself out there like that and protect your own, you know? These guards aren't here for me, right? They're here for themselves and their paycheck and their families. So they don't really care about me, right? So I just wanted to tell you guys that little beginning and just to let you know about the last part. Like I just got released about last year. Um, my, my most recent charge was with one of my uh, kids' mothers. I have two baby mothers and three kids. Um, they're all like eight years old and under. So my, my youngest one is eight months old. She's her name is Zayla. The last time I was incarcerated, I literally took it upon myself to like remove all negative from my soul because they had kept me in a cell for by myself for 37 days and I didn't even know my rights. So I had to literally look it up, get people to bring me papers. I was sitting here crying, singing, going crazy, watching people smear shit on the wall, you know? Kids younger than me losing their mind, right? And I spent 37 days in a hole and I don't think I can do anything to correct it at this point. I don't think I, I can pursue it. We are back. Um, so that was live footage from Toronto. We had speakers. Uh, Justin, can you give me those names again? Yeah, so the uh, the speakers were, um, just looking here, Wani, uh, Candice, and B. Unfortunately, the uh, footage for B's uh, talk uh, got cut short there for whatever reason. I honestly don't know. <laughs> so um, I apologize to B for that. Hopefully we can get you on uh, next year's uh, broadcast that did sound like the system was giving you a, a pretty rough ride and we'd like to to hear your story for sure and and what you'd like to see changed um but um the technical issues being what what they what they are and i'm i'm uh i've got a phd so i have no idea um that means i'm i'm good and i know one thing um and uh it's it's not uh zoom tech so um, I guess what we're going to do now is um, we have uh, uh, a few uh, speakers from the Free the People and the Torture Community Rally and Press Conference 
that was organized by the Disability Justice Network of Ontario earlier this afternoon. And that took place on the territory of the Mississaugas, the Huron Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee peoples uh, in Milton. Um, so we've got about um, 19 minutes of footage uh, from that. So I will play that. And I apologize in advance if it gets cut off, but I don't think it should. Um, so we should be good to go here. Uh, for those just joining us just to recap. Um, obviously, this is a we do a multi hour broadcast and we're in the part of the broadcast now where we're showing you footage from different vigils events that took place today. Uh, so we have a lot of recorded footage. So if you're just tuning in, you're getting the opportunity to hear from speakers, many with lived experience of incarceration from different prisons across this country. And as Justin said, we're now headed to Milton. All right, here we go. Currently incarcerated at Maple First here in Milton, Ontario. I am his voice on the outside, working tirelessly to get some justice for the suffering of the inmates of this facility and the guards that work there. This can no longer stay in the dark with only bits and pieces exposed so they don't get in trouble. And this can continue to happen with the truth never coming out. I am tired of sitting, listening, and seeing what's happening in there. I am in no way justifying the actions that led these inmates to be arrested. It's that everyone deserves and has the right to be treated humanely. These excessive lockdowns are having the same effect as long stays in segregation. I am seeing this with my own eyes when I visit or have a phone call. The lack of support for these prisoners with mental health concerns or addiction concerns or even support for navigating the criminal legal system is only making things worse, not better. If only they had, and I mean really had the supports in place with full access to these inmates, they could turn a new leaf and come out prepared for living in society again. If they had access to rehabilitation in the first place, they probably wouldn't even be incarcerated right now. And as someone with a loved one in this position, I know there is nothing readily av available, especially at Maplehurst. Then they are just shipped off to a place of torment, torture, and kept from their families for far too long. Even with a gap of nine years, my family member still fell hard again because he had zero support and was subjected to similar conditions and torture as a youth in the criminal system. It really shows that they are what they are still fell hard again because he had zero support. It's ruining really their lives and the lives of loved ones. Before being incarcerated, my family member was full of life ambitious, outgoing, loved music, and was so talented. He loved the outdoors and family road trips. Now I see a very broken man. This place breaks everyone who comes here and leaves everyone with no hope at all for a better life. This not only breaks the inmates, the families suffer too. With only so many lockdowns and the loss of visits and phone calls, with our loved ones going days or weeks with no contact whatsoever, so we don't even know if they're okay. Mothers, children, family, crying themselves to sleep, worried sick. Now, we now live scared, anxious, and stressed out, losing sleep and appetite, constantly making sure we don't miss that call because we don't know when another one will happen or if something bad had happened. Showing up to visits, being denied, and all because of understaffing or because they need to hide something to lock their access to the outside world. Family having to take the financial burden of filling an expensive canteen fund to be sure our loved ones had phone time that they barely get to call us on and extra snacks, food, hygiene products and having that taken as, away as punishment. Having to take on a lawyer's job because Maplehurst doesn't provide proper access for inmates to communicate with their lawyers. Tons of canceled lawyer calls. The courts never seem to have the paperwork or any proper communication between Maplehurst and the courts, resulting in so many remands or missed court dates. Or maybe that's on purpose, too. I would not put anything past the system these days. When it comes to Maplehurst, I wouldn't put anything past them, especially after the Institutional Crisis Intervention Team, the ICIT, unlawfully was brought on December 20th to the 24th, 2023, after an incident where a CO was assaulted by an individual inmate and others on a different range cheered. There was no crisis, there was no threat after everyone was locked down and the individual was cuffed and taken off the range. The ICIT and the guards at Maplehurst then proceeded to torture and degrade everyone on that unit, starting with turning on the industrial fans bringing in the outside air in the dead of winter. The guards wore sweaters, jackets, the inmates wore t-shirts and shorts. 
They took the TV, bedding, letters, pictures, sentimental items, which they can never get back. They took books they got out of canteen. They took their hygiene products and all their canteen items, the institutional food. They were left in their boxers with one and a half mattresses. Then they served their food while placing the trays on the hat, slamming the door shut so everything falls on the floor and they don't get to eat. Not given full meals, no shower, no yard, no medication that my loved one had to take for anxiety, depression, sleep, and addiction prevention purposes. Leaving him severely sick as well as many others who needed their medication. No toilet paper was provided or utensils, so they were forced to eat with the same hands they had to wipe with after using the washroom. No mental health care or health care period. The superintendent told the health care team not to treat their unit. They watched the ICIT team go from C block to A block, and then to B block and F block. They threw concussion grenades, and while everyone was disoriented from the flashbang, they would torture them by yelling something through the intercom at them so they could barely hear what was said. So they repeated themselves with nobody able to make out what was said. So they made their way to the door, only to be shot with pepper balls through the hatch, being yelled at, get away from the door. This is your last warning. Lay down on your bunk face down, or we will fuck you up. Everyone's sitting there with their eyes, nose burning, mouth burning. Then they came in with riot gear, pointing lasers at everyone, making everyone strip down to their boxers, made them stick their hands through the hatch so they could zip tie them. The harder they cried in pain, the harder they would twist their arms. They then dragged them down a hallway, made them sit cross-legged on the ground with their heads down while they screamed vulgar things at them, threatening them that if they moved, they would hurt them while pointing lasers at them and left them there for what seemed like forever to these inmates. They were asked if they were injured before being dragged to a hall, but even if they were injured, they were too afraid to say anything, not knowing what they would do to them next. On the way back to their cells, they twisted their arms hard in such a way that if they moved their arm, it would pop out of the socket. When brought back to their cell, they were being screamed at to get on their knees and twisted them up even more, resulting in breaking my loved one's cast from a previous injury acquired at Maplehurst, and then breaking his pinky finger and made him get on the ground, then left them in their cell and their boxers all beat up. When my loved one asked to see a nurse or a doctor after, he was denied and told there is nothing they can do about a broken finger, and this isn't vacation, you're in jail. They continue to unlawfully punish and take things away from this unit, and they continue to threaten them or make vulgar comments to them and keeping them locked down, just holding phone time and lawyer calls, or not bringing them to court and breaching their Section 7 and 12 charter rights continuously to this day. January after this innocent incident, the unit was locked down for an entire month. Then again, all of June locked down less a day for a shower. The inmates now have suffered with torture, threats, being assaulted, degraded, victims of theft, refused health care, mental or physical, now suffer with anxiety, depression, CPTSD, and lifelong impaired mental well-being. They have written to the abundsman with no reply except the uh, blue form request of medical documentation with nothing being done still. Just recently, a couple weeks ago, my loved one suffered with a very large, almost septic infection in his knee. From lack of hygiene products and cleanliness of the jail, overcrowding and lack of showers or medical care, and it took him busting it open to then just get antibiotics and a covering two weeks later. Before all of this with the ICET team, my loved one suffered a severe beating, being jumped by eight people and left with a severe brain injury, broken ribs, cheekbones, chipped teeth, and has not been properly given medical care. This is absolutely disgusting. All of this is so wrong. Maplehurst, the ICET, the guards and the COs all need to be held responsible. And this kind of inhumane treatment needs to be put to an end. This is unfortunately just the tip of the icebergs here, and there is a lot more going on behind the scenes throughout Maplehurst, and it all needs to be exposed and stopped. We cannot let them do this and hide this. I demand justice for the prisoners subjected to any form of inhumane treatment. I will not stay silent. Stop the torture. Thank you. That's <laughs> fucked up. Um, wow. Policing and prisons in this country were created to surveil and control Black and Indigenous people 
protects white people and property, particularly wealthy white people and property. Prisons are an extension of the white supremacist colonial arm, which is why we see policing and incarceration specifically targeting indigenous peoples, black people, racialized people, poor and working class people, disabled people, and queer and trans people. This is why we see people like Tyler Maxey, a disabled Afro-Indigenous man currently fighting for his life while under arrest in a hospital after Toronto police shot him during a mental health crisis. Racialized disabled people face longer, harsher sentences, are less likely to get bail, and are more likely to be put in segregation and have their behavior seen as problematic. We know that prisons are also sites of disablement, having life expectancy, creating disabilities, and worsening existing ones, from brain injuries to respiratory issues, from mold and poor air quality to gastrointestinal cardiovascular issues and diabetes from the food, a lack of sunlight and lockdown slash isolation, worsening mental and physical health, um, especially if you have to sleep on the floor, CPTSD from hypervigilance and overall torturous degrading conditions, delay and denial of medications and assistive devices, overall lack of opportunities to develop and update life skills, therefore becoming less equipped to navigate the world they wish them before entering, causing people to become institutionalized. Not only are prison sites of disablement, but they are also sites of death. At least 45 prisoners have died at Maplehurst since 2000 the highest number of all institutions that we know of um, across so-called Canada, um, including four in a week and a half period that happened this past February alone. Um, of the ones we do know of, we don't have all of the prisoners' names, dates of death, causes, or other critical information, which further dehumanizes them. I'm going to introduce Kylie, a registered nurse and sister who lost her younger brother to corrections in 2021. Since then, it has been her mission to speak out and advocate for social justice with a focus on prisoner rights. Thank you so much, Kylie. Um, was right here, Maplehurst Correctional Complex, three and a half years ago that my life would forever be changed. I would be thrown head first into a world I had no idea about. My naivety would be quickly ripped away. 1,325 days since I last saw my brother smile. Sorry, I get so emotional so talking about this. My brother Zach was only 26 years old. In the grand scheme of things, he was still a child. Zach was my little brother. I call him little loosely because it wasn't long before I was looking up to him. He was kind, adventurous, a fun child. He loved exploring. He had a great imagination. He would even play Barbies with us just to be able to spend some time with his sisters, being the only boy in the house. He loved to create things out of garbage. <laughs> his signature saying was, one man's junk is another man's treasure. <laughs> we had a tumultuous, tumultuous childhood, but we always had each other and family meant everything to him. He loved incredibly deeply, but the problem with that, as we all know, is you also hurt incredibly deeply. From an early age, he was plagued with depression and anxiety. He turned to substances to cope and feel, to feel normal. All of this was compounded with traumatic loss early on when we lost my, my son, his nephew, at the age of 15 months. He would then lose his four friends in one week, including his best friend, Aaron. His dependence on substance only worsened. This is where we began to see the failures of our healthcare system and mental health supports. He wanted help but the hospital would tell him, even as a suicidal youth, get clean first. Rehabs would put him on months long wait lists and offer booklets to read in the meantime. It would ultimately take incarceration for him to be able to get help. He was able to be assessed and diagnosed with manic depression and bipolar while he was in jail. He was started on medication while at the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center. For the first time in a long time, he was feeling hope for his future. He was incarcerated during COVID and due to the pandemic, he was transferred from the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center to Maplehurst. Shortly after his transfer, I got a call from his lawyer who was extremely concerned for his mental well-being. Zach was no longer getting to regularly talk to medical staff or social work. They were constantly in lockdown and denied their phone calls. And the violence happening inside there was horrific, even compared to the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center. We just, we put, 
we began discussing a plan to get him out on bail in the fall of 2020. It would be months before Zach would get a bail hearing. It was Christmas Eve of 2020 when we were granted one. He was over the moon and happy. He was going to be home for Christmas. He would get to see his little girls. I drove here 1,325 days ago on Christmas Eve in a snowstorm. I sat out there in that parking lot for hours, waiting and watching others get released into the storm. No ride, no coats, just walking out into the storm, wearing what my brother liked to call the Jail Force One loafers that they got inside. I immediately, or sorry, the feeling when I saw him walk out of that door was indescribable. Pure joy, we hugged for a good while. I immediately asked him about his medications as he was on multiple for his mental health as well as his addiction issues. He said medical staff had told him that they don't provide meds on release, but that they would uh, fax his prescriptions to a pharmacy of his choice. He gave them the pharmacy he had used previously that we knew was open on Christmas Day. So that was that. We went home to celebrate Christmas Eve and eat pizza. We got up early, we did gifts with my kids and then hurried over to the pharmacy. Henry, the pharmacist, remembered Zach which just made my heart so happy to know somebody actually cared. He was so happy to see Zach looking healthy and out of jail. He went to get the prescriptions only to find that there was none. Zach called Maplehurst and was told they wouldn't help him. I then called medical at Maplehurst myself and the response I was met with was, not an inmate anymore, not my problem. Those words haunt me to this day. In that moment, all of the hope, the feeling of work, and the sense of future Zach had was stripped away. The pharmacist also called on his behalf and was met with the same doors in his face. It was COVID, it was Christmas, there was no doctors available to assess Zach. Nobody could provide him medication until a week later on the Monday. Zach cried and I comforted him, naive and hopeful, just one week. We can get through it together. I had no concept of how difficult navigating life after incarceration was for the average person, never mind in the middle of a pandemic, mentally ill and denied the medications that were keeping him stable. Medications that were never meant to be stopped abruptly. It was not long before his anxiety was through the roof. He was having night sweats, bursting into tears at random, unable to sleep and hallucinating. He ran away on New Year's Eve. He left his rosary hanging in my car window. The thing he had said helped him get through jail. He left his coat, his smokes, and his phone, and a note apologizing for being a fuck up. He no longer felt his life was worth anything. And how could anyone was treated like less than dirt by these systems claiming to be corrections in healthcare? I called the police immediately for help, and all they cared about was that he broke bail. Zach's lawyer told me that the bail unit would be around daily at any hour looking for him. I saw them twice that month. They couldn't even be bothered to look for him. <laughs> when Zach was picked up, he was brought to the Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center, and he would die there within days. I never got to see him again after that day, but he disappeared, not alive. 26 years old, a father, a son, a friend, an uncle, and a brother. Zach was let down by many people and systems throughout his short life. But the decision by the medical staff at Maplehurst set him up to fail, a domino effect ultimately leading to his death. That death, along with so many others that I've learned about since then, is so much more far-reaching than the people who held their lives in their hands with such carelessness could ever comprehend. The pain that this causes daily, the families that it tears apart, the children who are now forced to live in the trauma, and the cycle continues on. There's no correcting happening in these places. These systems are not broken. They were built this way, which is why 49 years later, here we are on Prisoner's Justice Day and the injustices continue. The lack of care for human life continues on. This is what drives me to tell my brother's story. I can't save him now, but I can speak up for the ones currently facing these injustices. We can scream for change to prevent the next step and we can speak their names so they're not forgotten as the ministry so hopes that they will be. Their deaths will not be in vain. This is an uphill battle and it's hard, but getting to speak and see all of you here, keep your care, gives me hope. It's not for nothing. We have to keep fighting for the ones we've lost and the ones that are still in there fighting. We have to keep talking, keep saying their names. We will have justice.
Oh. Those were some heartbreaking speeches. Um, our heart goes out to everybody sharing those were that was in Milton, and we heard about the terrible consequences that stay with people past their incarceration and the complete lack of care or resources for anybody leaving these systems and caught up in them. Um, so that was Milton, and thank you to the speakers in Milton and for holding that event. Um, we're now going to share some clips from the Montreal event that took place earlier this evening. Um, I don't know, Justin, if you want to come and set up what we're looking at. I know that we have some clips from the event, and then we'll be headed live to Vancouver. Um, we'll have a, another interview with Sherry Meyer, and then we'll come back to Vancouver just to give you a map of the rest of the broadcast. So, Justin, do you want to set up what we're about to see? Fuck this system and fuck Maplehurst. That's all I have to say after that one. Anyways, um, yeah, so uh, in Kyotokai, uh, Muniwang, Montreal, um, we're going to play uh, four clips uh, from the annual uh, PJD vigil that happens uh, every year at uh, Parc Vinet. Um, and as per usual, hopefully the audio and uh, the video will all work out here. Uh, and if we run into technical uh, glitches, we're going straight to Vancouver. But uh, My shirt is also a Montreal <laughs> Prisoner Justice Day shirt. Yeah, very nice. They, they've got some pretty cool swag for this year, too, to, to raise funds for for the organizing work that they do there, too. We'll try and show that later. Um, so uh, I'm going to share the screen now and uh, cross our fingers here. Here we go. Well, my story, you know, my, the main part of my story is all that glitter is in gold. Um, I'm a lifer. 69 years old, but, you know, taking care of myself. I go back to the days when you made Justice Day the first trusted when my brothers here, they know. Um, B, I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Oh, so we'll we'll go back to that first clip if we can in a bit. I think it might have been partially downloaded, so hopefully I'll fix things on the background, but we're gonna listen to a song here. Okay. speaker i find very impactful and, can, and kind of connects to what we're doing right now is the majority of people that find themselves in a, in a position where they're in prison most of them have had the ideal childhood that would lead them towards their failure right most of the time when we find someone incarcerated society has already given them the short end of the stick however we the people that find themselves in that position they don't get the help that they need but instead they're discarded and put into a box and quarantined from society. And something that I find that we need to uh, realize and put, up, put, on, put on the forefront a lot more is to realize that the same way that you can take something negative to uh, use it as something to heal, it's the same way that we can take people that have gotten the short end of the stick to actually heal the rest of society. People like Doc, Freeman and all of the different people around here, including myself, who have been incarcerated, trying to help society is proof to that. Uh, up next, we're going to have some remarks uh, from Wendy and a banner intro. If we can have a round of applause. So we, as you can see, we just have short clips. So Justin is having to shift quickly between the clips, but uh, bear with us as we do that. I believe this is going to be the 
I think it's going to be the closing song for the event, and I'll I'll pull up some more stuff here. This song we're going to sing is the one that was built. I finished recording it about um, I actually recording it for the first time. Um, it, it's a Dakota song, and it's a Sioux Sioux assumed. Uh, the words in it uh, represent, represent uh, traditional dancers when they come to tell they the church on them and they cut their latch. They spend everything away in a good way. So that's some clips from the Montreal event. Um, and thank you especially to the singers for um, giving us, gifting us those songs and reminding us of uh, many of the important ceremonies that be taking place across this country as uh, we particularly think about um, Indigenous peoples. So nearly half or more than half of incarcerated women, federally are incarcerated women and over a third of all incarcerated people are Indigenous people. So we recognize the continuation of the residential school system and the ongoing colonization and genocide of Indigenous peoples that takes place in prison. We've heard from many um, people from various nations on this broadcast today. So um, we are now going, uh, where are we going, Justin? We're just going to stay, we'll, we'll come to me for a second and then we're going to go to, to Vancouver. So um, just to say that like at this point in the broadcast, um, I think we we can kind of return to uh, what the the how PJD started and also um, uh, what it's been mainly about over the years. And to do that, um, just to, to bring a reminder to folks who may just be joining us online, I'm going to read a bit from our, our friends at PJD in Montreal um, put together uh, in French. So I'm, I'm going to share some French content for a minute. Hopefully that's OK with folks. Um, and this is on Instagram. We'll post this on, on Facebook in a second. Donc, encore une fois, uh, aujourd'hui, c'est la veille pour la journée de la justice uh, pour les uh, détenus. Um, donc, il y a eu un événement aujourd'hui à, à Montréal, à Parc Vinet, um, uh, qui a commencé à 14 heures aujourd'hui. Um, on reconnaît que 
chaque dessous, euh, les détenus participent à la journée de la justice pour les détenus en jeûnant et en refusant de travailler pour la journée. Euh, cette pratique remonte à 1975, lorsque des détenus du pénitencier de Millhaven, situé à l'extérieur de Kingston, en Ontario, ont organisé une journée de grève de la faim, d'arrêt de travail et de vigile en honneur de deux prisonniers décédés en isolement. Donc, euh, on sait, par exemple, euh, que cette année, ça marque le cinquantième anniversaire de la mort de l'un de, de ces prisonniers-là, Edward Nalen. Euh, puis voici euh, 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 un passage euh, des mots de prisonjustice.ca qui ont été traduits. Euh, Eddie purgeait une peine d'emprisonnement à perpétuer, perpétuer et avait fait des allers-retours en isolement depuis le début de sa peine. Il connaissait bien les procédures de la prison et le fonctionnement du comité d'examen des cas d'isolement. Même si Adi s'est suicidé au petit matin du dessous, les preuves montrent clairement que la main qui a tenu la lame de rasoir est celle du système pénitentiaire et de ses administrateurs apathiques. Um, il continue uh, qu'il s'agisse du trou de l'isolement ou des unités d'intervention structurées L'isolement et le manque de communication se poursuivent aujourd'hui et causent beaucoup de douleurs et de souffrances. Nous luttons pour mettre fin à toutes les formes d'isolement carcéral et à toutes les formes de prison. Donc, euh, merci euh, aux gens euh, à Montréal euh, qui ont euh, mis ça ensemble. Euh, on va maintenant passer à Vancouver. Elle, um, if you could just... Uh, Hold us for like about a minute. I'm going to transition us from here, okay? Thank you, Justin. And thank you for getting that uh, bilingual content in. Uh, just a shout out to Justin. Um, this event always comes together. We always think about it and plan it, you know, as usual with activists and people in a bit of a scramble. Normally, uh, comrade Desmond Cole hosts this broadcast with me. And I said, oh, you know, Desmond's not available. I need a co-host. And Justin swore he was just going to be behind the scenes. There's a lot of tech stuff, as you can see, putting up different interviews. Some of that stuff is coming in as we speak. And so Justin didn't think he was going to be co-hosting and has really been jumped in as we go into doing some of these hosting duties. So thank you, Justin, who's also, as I said, like frantically behind the scenes, also uh, connecting with people that we're bringing in to do the interviews, um, clipping stuff as they come. So thanks, Justin. It's your hard work that has got this broadcast off the ground as well as everybody else. And I'm about to frantically bring in an interviewee from Regina instead of going to Vancouver. So <laughs> uh, please welcome Sherry Meyer coming to the broadcast. If you just want to cue that up. Well, I guess I could. Um, so uh, earlier today, um, Sherry and others uh, from Beyond Prison Walls organized pr a Prisoner's Justice Day Memorial at the Saskatchewan Legislature, uh, which took place on Treaty 4 territory in Regina this morning. So Sherry is here. Uh, and sorry, Sherry, for just bringing you in like this. Uh, just some technical issues on our end with Vancouver. Um, uh, just to talk about uh, how you uh, organized the event, what happened at the event, and uh, what are the kinds of things you're hearing about that goes on inside that needs to be dealt with. Um, and uh, Elle, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Sherry. Welcome to the show. And of course, we had Faith Eagle earlier, who spoke to us as well about your support and work and how important that is. And we've all also seen many of your emails coming across our inboxes that show the constant advocacy that you've been doing. So welcome to the Prisoner Justice Day broadcast. This is really Thank your you. So I don't know if you want to introduce yourself and speak a bit about the work you're doing and what took place today in your event. So I'm a prisoner advocate. My name is Sherry Gordon from Regina, Saskatchewan. I am also a prisoner wife to a lifer who is serving time. Um, so I organized the event kind of just kind of like last year, spur of the moment kind of thing. So we didn't quite have the biggest turnout, but we were glad that Faith Eagle was there. Um, Julie Paul came and did her Indigenous dancing. So that was great. Um, we were actually kind of blessed, I think, because we didn't have the big turnout, but there was a lot of uh, there was another I guess a Christian Jesus walk going on. So a lot of people came and they started asking questions and they started reading all the names. So it was really kind of a, a blessing in disguise that there were other people there. And it was, it was nice to see. And, you know, I, I do this, this is my second year doing it. I've participated in other, other prisoner justice day stuff, but to actually hold it, 
I know it was, it, it's good. I see a lot of these issues happening, you know, with Faith Eagle. That was a big thing when she did her hunger strike, the injustices those women face. Um, even before that, there was like Corey Cardinal during COVID. You know, he was a big, big advocate. Uh, same with Cherie Sutherland Casey. These are all like we we remember made uh, a tribute to them today too, not just to the inmates that had their lives lost, but to those that I called them influential leaders in Saskatchewan prisons because they have, you know, even my husband, I remember even before COVID, the things that he went through. Um, and I always have to say, I thank Justin, I don't know, Dr. Justin Pichet because he did, he advocated really hard for us to get my husband to where he is today. And I see all these, you know, these lives lost and these things that people go through and we went through those and I'm very blessed and grateful that my husband is in a place right now where he is getting, you know, the proper care and finally getting the mental health that he needs that he should have got, you know, 20 years ago when he entered the system as a youth and into an adult prison. So it's, uh, it is, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow to see that, you know, still all this injustices are going on, but I really do think that, you know, if Corey Cardinal was still alive right now, he'd be very proud to see what people are doing across Saskatchewan, he'd be very proud of people, you know, like Faith and Sharice. And, you know, it's because of him that I actually got in touch with Faith and Sharice um, Sutherland. So it's, uh, yeah, it's great to be able to do that. Thank you for bringing up Corey Cardinal. And if you Google Corey Cardinal, you can see a lot of his writing and work. Sadly, uh, Corey died by toxic drug supply shortly after he was released. And while we may not count that as a death in custody, we know it's directly related to the conditions in custody uh, where a treatment is not provided. And there are many people who go in with addiction issues um, because then you become, when you get out and haven't solved any of the trauma and have more trauma placed on top of that, and then are more vulnerable to the drug supply because of the time period of being cut off from it, we see extremely high rates of death of toxic drug supply from people who are coming out of jails without the supports they need, without housing, without employment, uh, without community supports, all the things that jail directly strips away from you. So Corey, as you said, was a really important advocate, um, particularly during COVID for the rights of people in prison and indigenous prisoners as well, um, a huge loss to the community. So thank you for bringing up Corey's name. Um, yeah, there's another one. I know he was very, um, when you're talking about people being released without a place to go, I've heard a few people today talk about that. There was uh, Kimberly Squirrel. She was another one that died. She's leaving Pine Grove. She was left to go walk out at the, in the middle of winter and she froze to death just, I don't know, maybe a few steps away from maybe five minutes from Pine Grove. So that was a huge loss. And I guess even like the abuse on inmates, I've seen the abuse on, you know, a lot of federal guys, like my husband himself, he endured a lot of abuse out at Sass Penn and Edmonton Max, and so did others. But even in the provincial system, there was a, a young man that was with us today at our protest. Um, his grandmother, Sonia Keepness, uh, was one of the first people from Saskatchewan to be tracked as a death in Pine Grove. And him too, he he experienced abuse and it's just, you know, it's, it's it's heartbreaking, especially, you know, seeing anybody have to go through that. And this is just a young man that was probably, you know, really maybe one of his first prison sentences or in, in, in uh, provincial custody. And it's just, I don't know, it's how these guards get away with this kind of stuff. They should be held accountable, but nobody is. And I know he's meeting with the uh, Human Rights Commission of Saskatchewan here at the end of the month. And I know one of the things that he's asked was for them to, you know, have some sort of cultural training. And that's something Faith has asked, you know, before too, when she did her mediation. I think it's very important that these guards would take some sort of cultural training because I don't, maybe it would give them some sort of heart to treat people a little bit better. I know we've obviously talked a lot today and today is focusing and centering people who are inside prisons, but we're also hearing a lot from loved ones of the impact that having a loved one in prison has on your family. Um, mm -hmm. so maybe we could speak a bit about that, some of the barriers especially. So even though CSC, for example, says that visits are positive and will often dangle visits in front of people or withdraw visits as punishment, mm -hmm. we know that the prison system could not run without families and loved ones from putting money into canteen, paying for the phones. And um, they really rely upon that support and stability to keep people behaving and calm and controlled inside prison. So um, they rely on the supports of family, but then make it so difficult for people to come in. So uh, maybe we could speak a bit about some of the barriers that you know we experience when you go in to visit a loved one or just attempting to have contact or attempting to do this support. Um, I know you've experienced many of the same, like frankly, bullshit that all of us 
Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of barriers. I I think you are are probably on my email chain. I know Dr. Piche has been when I was experiencing the ion scanner bullshit. And that's a lot of it, what it was because those create false positives. And I've been with my husband. We got married last year at the Regional Psychiatric Center in Saskatoon. And just to do that was hard. I'm grateful that he got there. But before that, we had to write an essay as to why we wanted to be married. And before that, quite frankly, we couldn't even touch each other. Like we've been together five years and we only got to touch each other it was a year last June. So it's been about two years now that we've actually been able to touch each other. But for a good portion of our relationship, it was we had COVID. And then when we got visits, we got one visit in person and we couldn't touch because of the restrictions. And then it was, well, you're hitting for your eye on the ion scanner. So we did our three booth visits. And that's a big thing. If you hit, you're getting those booth visits and you have no contact, like no touching. And the whole point of going to a visit is you can touch that person because they don't get that meaningful connection so we would do those booth visits and then all of a sudden we would the last one would be good and we're like yay we get to touch each other well we're hit again another ion scanner so three more so we did like six rounds of those and you know that took a toll on my on him because it was a barrier and he was like you know are we ever going to get past this are we ever going to get our conjugal like the pfb visits because without getting three of those you're not going to get it to the pfe because you're high risk uh so it took a toll on me and i eventually had to navigate through the system somehow and the only way i could do that was that i still do it to this day i wash my clothes at nighttime the night before i'm going for a visit tomorrow so i'll be doing this very soon i will wash my clothes i will don't touch them without uh, having clean hands i will put them in a sealed ziploc bag I will go take them to the jail. I will go in the bathroom at the jail and I will change into those clothes. And they do. They look at me like I'm crazy. Not so much now, but before they used to joke like, well, maybe you should be the one inside this like center. Like, yeah, I kind of thought I should have been at one point. So, you know, I, I still do that to, to this very day. Just even if I go in for a morning visit, like I was just there last week. I went for a morning visit at 830. I changed and then I left because I had my PFE at one o'clock and I changed again even though I was going in just because I have anxiety that if I don't do it, I won't get in. For those who don't know what we're talking about, so much like the airport, um, there's these scanners in prison. Yeah. So when you're going to a prison, you have to go within this window, you have to put like yourself in a locker, and then you go through metal detectors, then they do scanning, then they bring out a dog. There's a whole process before you can go in, all of which, by the way, cuts into your visiting time. So if you have a visit from say like one to four, they don't start processing people until one. Um, so if you, you could be waiting an hour, uh, to get processed, just to get into that room and you don't get extra visiting time, but, uh, so the scanners much like at the airport, these are, you know, to check for like drug residue. Um, they have an incredibly high rate of false positives. Absolutely. I think it's like 90% false positives. Um, there's no appeal system. So if you hit on the scanner, you can't go call your lawyer or go at people have offered, like you can strip search me. I want to go in. Um, I've this, offered that. Yeah, there's no yep. appeal on that. Um, road salt can hit on it. Pumping gas can hit on it. Um, hand sanitizer. And so especially mm -hmm. like while we're still in a pandemic, you could have just put sanitizer on your hands. That can hit on it. Um, notoriously, the McDonald's by Renews used to have like a hand soap that would hit on the scanners. Um, so this is a completely arbitrary barrier. And we've had like elders, grandmothers, whoever. And if they say, oh, you know, you're, you're a positive um, yeah, you, you can't be like, no, I'm not <laughs> like yeah. that it's down for you or trying to traffic drugs or there's this, you know, hit on you. And as uh, we just heard, that means that the next visits have to be held behind glass with no touching. And so that means I was able to appeal it. I was able to appeal mine all the times, but I hear people aren't. Um, I'm actually grateful that they don't always use the ion scanner at regional site, but I don't know if they're going to use it, but they do bring the dogs. And actually, I was just saying like last weekend, I went for my PFE. Uh, I went for my visit. They asked me to bring my bags in early, so I did. They went through everything. They dogged me. For some reason, the dog sat. They emptied everything out again, opened my shampoo bottles, all my toiletries, looked inside with a flashlight. I don't know what the reason was for. Um, I get it. There's a, There are drugs that come into the institution, and the psych center is probably one of the places you don't want drugs to come into the institution. Um, but they've been really good with me with my visits. It's everywhere else that I had a problem. Uh, to, to get into a psych center, I did have problems at first. I had to appeal it with a 12-page uh, document that I wrote to prove, and I investigated how the ion scanners create the false positives because they don't test for the drug. 
they test for the same molecular structure as the drugs. So I think they just got really pissed off with me and were like, you can have your visits, just shut up. Because <laughs> they, the warden, every warden of every institution, we've been together five years and we're at our fourth institution. We're hoping to go now into uh, a healing lodge for him. So he's working really hard to get to that until we get his review. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's been a battle. And I do, I feel sorry because I hear a lot of people that go through the same bullshit that we went through. And it's... It's awful, you know, like, I even like Sass Penn right now, you know, the um, Julie Paul, her son is over there. And she was even saying too, you know, they're having restrictions on visits, because if you piss dirty off her drugs, then you get like restrictions. So you're on booth visits. And that's kind of hard, you know, when you, you just need that contact. A lot of guys are doing drugs because they don't have visits. They don't have that contact. And that their policies, I think, if they do, they kind of need to be changed or they need to be tested more often. I remember when my husband was in that situation, he was constantly using drugs and Part of it probably was because he didn't have that human contact. I've, you know, you talk about families witnessing things. I've sat on the phone and heard my husband slash up guards sitting there saying, drop it, drop it. And he was like, back the fuck away or I'm, pardon my French, but he was like, back the fuck away or I'm going to slash my neck. And that was during COVID. That was during, you know, the uh, children with the unmarked graves and all of a sudden the phone goes dead. And, you know, they tackled him down. I've had him not call for days and I had to worry, you know, crazily about him and call the institution and I'm told, well, if he would only not act up, he needed a timeout for acting up. And here they throw him in an ob cell for 20. I think he was in there for about three days, constantly watched. And the only way he got out of there was he threatened to call the RCMP. He says, if you don't get me the F out of here, I'm going to call the RCMP. And that's when he called me and that's kind of where I think a lot of my advocacy really took off just because the injustices that he went through as an Indigenous man, just as an inmate. And I don't even like to call them inmates. I don't like to call them prisoners. I made the comment here earlier today about uh, a guy who was in a long-term offender. And when he got off, he wrote this document and he said the best way to refer to prisoners is not that way. They should be called um, incarcerated Canadian citizens because that's what they are. And I think, you know, a lot of people don't remember that they do have rights. They do fall under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And these institutions like to break that. And I, you know, I give credit to people like Corey Cardinal and, you know, Faith Eagle and Sharice, all these people who really, they protest for their rights when they're violated. And I think that's very important to remember. A lot of people just forget that. So Sherry, if people want to um, connect with you, track your work, where can they find you? Uh, so I'm on Twitter. It's under, I think it's uh, the uh, Prison Walls is what it's called. But the easiest way is on Facebook. So we were beyond Prison Walls Canada. And then as of February, we actually got nonprofit status. I haven't done a lot with it. But so now the Facebook page has changed to Beyond Prison Walls Canada Society Inc. So we're on there. I'm quite responsive. If people need help, I still do things. Help out. Um, Just so people know what kind of advocacy work do you do what can they contact you for uh they can contact me for pretty much anything i you know i'm there for support um i used to do a lot of like grievances and help people with a lot of federal stuff but i kind of i don't really put my nose into federal stuff just because it causes a lot of problems but i do still people reach out to me i do connect them um i do i'm very close with the vice chief of the congress of aboriginal people kim bowden so i will try and send things his way if i can't but provincial um you know, Saskatchewan provincial is the easiest thing for me to deal with. I don't need to get any backlash from it. I just, when I kind of, I hate to say I stepped back from advocating on the federal level, but when I did, uh, when I was really active in it, it kind of caused a lot of issues. You know, there was a lot of harm done to my husband for it. There was a lot of harm for me. So they always said, you know, shut your mouths and I'll never shut my mouth, but I just kind of, I tread lightly. <laughs> kind of. Yeah very real right that like yeah. we're on the outside and the person that can be got at is the person on the inside who can be denied visits denied food transferred into different situations transferred away um given level like all kinds of retaliation so um we've said throughout the show that people and a lot of people that are coming to speak on us to us are not off parole in other conditions mm -hmm. themselves. um so it takes a lot of courage for everyone to speak out because not only of the stigma but because of the real consequences. So Sherry, thank you for joining us. We are about to move, I think, going live into Vancouver. So thank we you. have to end our time with you, but thank you so thank much you. for your work. If you're thank you. love to your, thank my you. love to your husband. And I thank need you. to talk to you about school, I think as well, right? Sorry? 
I need to connect to me about school. Is that the case? I think yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, meaning thank you. Too, I was away, so we will connect offline. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thank Bye. you so much. And Justin, if we're ready, we can uh, go into Vancouver now. Are we ready? Uh, oh, perfect. So we're joining live uh, now Vancouver, uh, which has one of the longest running Prisoner Justice Day. I believe this is at the Claire Colhane Memorial. Uh, so I don't know, Justin, if you want to set us up any further. I think we're just joining as Minakshi Mano has been speaking. And I'm not sure I see Justin moving a clip. So when we state approved and signed by the Court of Canada, and that inmate cannot get the opportunity to end a halfway house or be granted parole after serving over 10 years in prison. Is this normal? Inmates doing life sentence got no hope of rehabilitating back in society because the parole board and parole officers are not being transparent. And hundreds of these men lost hope and will never see their families on the outside world again. Please take to account all these men finish their prison sentences the CSC and the parole board refuse to rehabilitate them back to society. Why? This is just the reality inside CSC facilities and institutions. Please pray for us men. Some of us still stand in solidarity with each other. Prison Justice Day Committee Vancouver for sure would stand with us in solidarity. Please keep the good work. Yours truly, Randy Blackwood, Mission Median CSC. I hope you can tell Randy we you heard his words? I think this goes back to what, you know, the folks from Jordan Effort were saying that it's a one size all fit program. There is no real interest in rehabilitating people. And at the end of the day, prison is a massive money maker, right? It's a massive industry. It's not quite the privatized prisons of the States, but it is an industry, right? Um, everyone working there, is on the take. Those community resources, the CSC funded facilities. I just saw something about like a trans history project at UVic that was getting CSC funding. And I thought, how shameful, how absolutely shameful that people are saying that this is liberatory work and you're taking money from such a genocidal institution that actually does like incredible harm to trans people inside. But some people will take any money, right? Um, I asked the researchers to get back to me, but they hadn't. Um, I'm going to invite a couple more folks up to speak. Uh, so you're not just hearing my rants. And the next speaker I have is Q, who is an artist and organizer um, who just moved closer to Vancouver and um, has spoken here in previous years. Thank you so much, Q, for joining us today. It's a considerably closer trip, a 10 minute bike ride, instead of last year. What was it like a two hour car ride? <laughs> Quite a bit closer. Um, yeah, I'm Q. Um, I've done a little bit of time inside myself um, through the Judy system, um, but I prefer to center someone else on this day um my brother some would say died some would say killed i would say killed uh, my brother was killed by um the state uh you know they they injured him pretty badly uh in his arrest um and then um he was left to to die of COVID while handcuffed to his bed. Um, and, you know, I think of the, I actually really appreciate it. I was hoping I would, I would be speaking after Randy's word that machine shared with us, um, talking about solidarity inside, because something that's pretty heavy on my mind every day, but especially this day is 
solidarity on the outside. And then, of course, thinking of joint efforts work, bridging that gap with the inside and the outside. Um, my mom died um, quite recently. Uh, um, she she took her life because of the grief of my brother's death. Um, and so I'm thinking of, you know, she was someone that was failed for her whole life by systems of support, um, whether that's the prison industrial complex, which she had her own experience with, or the medical industrial complex, which she was neglected by and harmed by, you know. And yeah, I just think of what solidarity between all of us looks like because we're all we have, us on the outside, folks on the inside, um, and we need to be all, all that we need. We need to be collectively, whether that's locally or globally, across state borders, because borders are fucking fake. What does solidarity actually look like? What does care actually look like? And are we are we actually taking care of our people, whether they're inside or outside, or grieving people that have died on the inside or the outside? What what are we actually doing for each other? Uh, um, you know, I think of mutual aid and how it grows out of poor people and drug users and black people and sex workers and people on the streets and people on the inside. And, you know, you hear from old time lifers about what solidarity on the inside has looked like and could look like again. I know that some institutions have more inside solidarity than others and how do we help the people inside grow their solidarity while we grow our solidarity on the outside? What does that work look like? I think it looks like 10 pals. I think it looks like 10 packs and out packs. Um, looks like feeding each other. Looks like showing the fuck up when we're tired, but someone needs a ride from the airport because they're visiting someone that lives, you know, three provinces away or whatever the fuck. It looks like doing the <laughs> the the 10 p.m. run for food because everyone forgot to eat and you know in a in an era of pandemics and you know seeing polio in fucking Gaza um then it also looks like masks and filters and, and doing things that the state won't do um you know, people inside fought for their own masking and hand sanitizer and, and everything because everything is restricted when you're in a prison. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Randy, for the, the words on solidarity. And thanks to everyone for coming out here. It's really cool to see this day grow every year. Thank you so much, Q, for sharing a few words. And as you're speaking about conditions in Gaza, and I think most of us are aware of what's been happening in occupied Palestine, um, about the conditions in those prisons, about the horrors that prisoners endure, political or not. Um, and those conditions are reflected in Canadian prisons as well, right? We've heard about rampant sexual violence that is the norm um, that institutions cover up, that wardens cover up. Um, in Newfoundland, a prison guard just released, just received an absolute discharge for allowing um, unsanctioned dental work on other prisoners. So, you know, medical experimentation done by a prison guard. Um, and, you know, it's, it's so striking, right, when you hear stories like Jackie's where just, just for being present, you can get 10 years. And then you hear about the violence the prison guards do and they get absolute discharges. Like it's unbelievable. Um, it, it highlights that this is there by design, right? That the 
the level of violence can't go away. You know, it's important that we keep fighting it and we keep naming the human rights violations that are occurring, but we can't be deceived into believing that we will make a better prison. It would be a disservice to everyone whose name is listed here to pretend that. I also want to make some more comments about um, how we're organizing and fundraising to keep, to keep people free, specifically on drug war charges. And I want to remind us that while we're trying to free people, let's not forget about the people who are actually locked up for drug war crimes, right? Like the black and brown and Arab guys who are incarcerated in the federal prisons, not just the white folks who did a catchy thing. The social, economic, and fundamentally colonial prisons whose incarceration remains fundamental to this country. Um, I just spoke with a friend of mine in so-called Ottawa, someone who's done time in the and, and, you know, they were like, like they didn't want to go to PJD today. Um, they were like, I want to spend it with Khan. Like, I want to spend it with people who actually know what's up, um, people who actually care. It is really difficult to talk about solidarity because I know that for a lot of us, we're pulled in so many directions right now because we watch like increasing and rapid cycling horrors over and over. And it's hard to know where to start, but I, I think you gave us a few good tips, right? It is like putting together a pen pack, you know, like join effort has shopping lists. You can go out and pick things up so that people actually have some decent clothes and hygiene products when they first go in. It's meeting people with, for like a coffee, which Kirsten talked about in a short film that Rosie made. Um, you know, having a meal with folks, just, you know, going for a walk in the park, like spending real genuine time with people. It doesn't have to be this big, scary endeavor. It's, you don't need a degree to be a good person. You can just do it. I mean, that's what I've learned from like my abolitionist teachers in the audience. You just show up, show up for pe people, It'll be messy, it'll be hard, but you can just be there and be present. You can write someone a letter um, consistently, right? Uh, don't just write to a pen pal because it's August 10th and you want to do the right thing. Like build that relationship, send them cards, like send people art inside, um, something to put up on that cinder block. I'm gonna invite Mercedes Ang if she's still here to join us. I don't know. Yes, there she is. Um, one of our favorite poets um, who's spoken at Prison Justice Day many years, um, who has an upcoming book that I think is more about police, which I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> yeah, fuck the police and fuck prison. This one is my one. Um, hey everybody, my name is Mercedes. Um, I come, I guess, to this day because my dad was inside a lot when I was a kid. Um, she died in the 90s overdose crisis, so he didn't die in cell, but somehow it still seems accurate to say that he died of the system. Um, as and actually is saying, this um, book that I am working or wrote um, is more about the police. It's more specifically about Vancouver Police Department and their crimes um, and about uh, the cop loving um, mayor that we have. Um, but we, we know that the police are the way that people get to the to prisons. I've been thinking a lot about the words safety and care, um, just because the mayor ran his whole campaign on this idea of public safety, and it's just very clear that some people's safety matters and other people's safety doesn't. Um, thinking a lot about the words care um, as well. Safety does not look like 100 new cops, 100 new car 87 versus safety does not look like a Ruru Remen finance row mayor buddying up with a billionaire. Safety does not look like cops investigating themselves, cops opting for retirement than joining the military. Big trucks with thin blue line stickers 
strengthening their motors. Safety does not look like decamping the DTES. Safety does not look like security on anti on Popos in Taipei in Chinatown Plaza because they don't have a permit. Safety does not look like Indigenous mothers writing their names on their children's arms so that their children can be identified if their limbs are separated from their bodies, if their bodies are not intact. Safety does not look like Indigenous mothers and families investigating their daughters' disappearances and murders because the police's negligent investigations ascertain their daughters' deaths to be unsuspicious. Safety does not look like Gas Town, Chinatown, Strathcona, Rail Town residents who loved everything, everywhere, all at once, but don't care about displacing MCs or popos who look like the protagonists. Safety does not look like protection of property over poor people, does not look like corporate values of a fun city with swagger. Safety does not look like determining a teenage white boy's racist threats, unthreatening. Safety does not look like cops at Memorial March or cops at Pride. It certainly doesn't sound like cops making drums either. Safety does not look like momentarily worn orange shirts over BPD uniform for a photo op. Safety does not look like see something, say something. Safety does not look like a Vancouver branch of Bank of Montreal staff calling 911 on a grandfather for trying to open a bank account for his granddaughter using their government status cards. Safety does not look like the VPD handcuffing the grandfather, Maxwell Johnson, at the Hill Suck Nation, and his granddaughter for being Indigenous while trying to open a bank account. Safety does not look like wellness checks, compassion, fatigue, and in intentional blindness. Safety does not look like feminisms that seek to punish or essentialize. Safety does not look like golf shirts and smaller guns. Safety does not look like deploying sniffer dogs and the recently rebranded community industry response group at protests calling for the end of the killing of children. Safety does not look like people at Crab Park drinking $8 coffee saying house people shouldn't have pets that they have for companionship and safety while the expensive coffee drinkers purebred dogs kiss on the grass that people would like to sit on. Safety does not look like weaponizing dogs. Safety does not look like the VPD tweeting a donation request for Ill uh, easily militarized cyber trucks that the billionaire who bought a social media platform to stop the woke mind virus from infecting said platform. Safety does not look like the fire marshal's order to decamp the, DT, uh, the downtown east side over fire concerns. Safety does not look like a family flame on the street. Safety does not look like failing to inform businesses located in a 100-year-old building that said building is on fire watch. Safety does not look like informing residents in a 100-year-old building that is on failing to inform residents living in a 100-year-old building, that building being on fire watch. Safety does not look like empty fire extinguishers at a 100-year-old building on fire watch. Safety does not look like cop enforced injunctions to dismantle 10 cities, does not look like diverse hiring and cultural awareness training. Safety does not look like blue walls of silence. Safety does not look like any team whose, be whose name begins with assertive. Folks, I don't know how you have seen those assertive outreach teams are, um, that are forcing folks into recovery, whether they want it or not. Safety does not look like being incarcerated under the Mental Health Care Act. Here looks like 100,000 new social housing units. Here looks like 1,000 new public washrooms. Here looks like catching people when they're trying to defy gravity. Here looks like using the buddy system to and from a blockade that shut down the city's port the biggest port in Canada, the third largest port in North America. Here looks like providing fire extinguishers to unhoused people, use fire to keep warm and food. Here looks like food security and access to clean water. Here looks like masks for East Van. Here looks like 
OPS fans in Narcan training and supply. Care looks like looking away if a hungry person takes food they didn't pay for. Care looks like fighting for social housing and affordable housing, fighting for an inclusive, equitable in the town. Care looks like a radical rethinking of rights that moves from individualism and charity to mutual aid. Care looks like living wage and free transit. Care looks like feeding the hungry children of Vancouver who need food programs at their schools, not fucking cops. Care looks like shared risk. Care looks like understanding fight, flight, freeze, bomb, trauma responses. Care looks like prisoners justice thing. Care looks like peer to peer support and you. Care looks like your workmates grabbing extra bad date sheets, condoms, and lube in case you miss the van. Care looks like Tracy Morrison walking towards you, panic in one hand, clean syringes in the other. Mr. Care looks like hundreds and thousands in the street, despite police surveillance and violence. Care looks like care pods and chosen families. Looks like assistive technologies like vibrating or flashing light alert systems to warn deaf residents of a fire in their hundred year old uh, building on Firewatch. Care looks like a five hour Palestinian poetry sit in led by students, despite those students already having, already having been positioned as a threat to student safety. Care looks like a fully funded Canada disability benefit, like Crips for ESIMs for Gaza, like a daughter and a father staging a model minority mutiny. Care looks like consent-based models of medical treatment. Care looks like defunding, disarming, dismantling, and then rebuilding from the ground up. Thanks, everybody. So that was Vancouver. And thank you. That poem was amazing. And uh, thank you so much to Minakshi Mano and everybody at the Vancouver Memorial for sharing. We heard some really important words. Um, we are coming to the end of our broadcast. We want to shout out everybody across the country who has been holding events both inside prisons and outside the walls, um, the various vigils, protests, uh, memorials that have been taking place. Um, so we're moving towards the end of our broadcast now. Um, I want to just thank everybody and remind us what we have listened to throughout this broadcast. We want to thank all the people that we interviewed, um, so including Sandy Pitzel, who spoke at yesterday's Tracking Injustice press conference, Vicky Chartrand from the Center for Justice Exchange, who spoke with a Cree man imprisoned at Archambault. We heard from Faith Eagle Live, who was involved in hunger strikes around the conditions of confinement in Pine Grove Correctional Center in Saskatchewan. Fallon Abbey, who was recently in re Abbey, who was recently released from prison and has fought for transitioning people and women in prison. We heard from Fadi Enab on the plight of Palestinian political prisoners, as well as also hearing from the Palestinian Political Prisoner Solidarity Project. We had a reading of Abolition is Love by Cyrus Marcus Ware, illustrated by Alana Fricker, which is a children's book that also includes scenes familiar from Prisoner Justice Day. Rachel from CFRC Prison Radio speaking about the importance that prison radios had in organizing inside and outside prison. Sherry Gordon from Beyond Prison Walls who organized Prisoners Justice Day Memorial in Saskatchewan. We also heard about Sherry's advocacy uh, for those inside, including her own husband and also the work that she has done with so many uh, incarcerated people in Saskatchewan as well. And so that protest and memorial took place at Saskatchewan Legislature on Treaty 4 territory in Regina. We also heard statements from many incarcerated people, including an Indigenous man held in Barden Jail or Hamilton Wentworth Detention Centre in Ontario. Messages from incarcerated people in the Women's Institution of Nova Institution, located in Mi'kmaq territory in Truro, Nova Scotia. And those, uh, we heard many, many messages of solidarity and remembrance. Uh, to people they know who have died while in custody. 
Thank you also to Rachel and Bobby who took part in the Prisoner Justice Day Healing Circle at P4W in Kingston. And that Healing Circle was hosted as every year by the P4W Memorial Collective. Um, we also heard the launch of Uncaged, which is a prison transparency project podcast hosted by journalist and Carleton University professor Adrian Harewood. And again, you can hear episodes from that monthly and they will be released, be released online. Um, we had event clips from Totiaki, Montreal, unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory in Ottawa, so-called. The territory of the Mississaugas, Huron Wendat, and Haudenosaunee—I'm it's too late today. Haudenosaunee peoples in Milton. I'm sorry, guys. Um, Haudenosaunee people in Milton. Let me say that again. Um, the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people, also known as so-called Vancouver. Um, so we thank everybody for sharing clips from that event. Sorry for messing up that pronunciation. I hate when that happens. It's gross. Um, so my apologies for that. Um, so I'm going to switch over to Justin now, who's going to remind us of some of the demands that both historically have been made and current demands being made today. And then we are going to read some of the names um, that have been tracked in the Tracking Injustice Project on Deaths in Custody, um, just to bear witness to those names. Um, and we will be closing shortly. So thank you to everybody who joined us. Thank you to all the incarcerated people in particular who have shared words or who have just been with us, um, those whose lives have been lost and those who continue to suffer in torture behind those walls. Justin, I'm gonna send it over to you. It sounds, sounds good. And um, so I'll just uh, read some of the older demands related to uh, Prisoner's Justice Day. Uh, these ones were articulated by the Odyssey Group, uh, the Odyssey Group for folks who don't know, uh, was formed at Millhaven Institution in 1976 um, in the early days of PJD. And their goal was to grow PJD uh, first into a national movement. And uh, the work that the Odyssey Group has done has been documented in a journal of Prisoners on Prisons article by Bob Gaucher, which was published in 1991. Um, I'll post the link in, in Facebook in a sec. Organizing Inside Prison Justice Day, August 10th, a nonviolent response uh, to penal repression. And so these demands are from 1979, uh, and we'll just read them here. Um, the right to meaningful work with fair wages. The right to useful education and training. The right to proper medical attention. The right to freedom of speech and religion. The right to free and adequate legal services the right to independent review of all prison decision-making and to conditions, the right to vote, the right to form a union, the right to adequate work and fire safety standards, the right to open visits and correspondence, the right to natural justice and due process. Now, when we read those demands and we think about all the blood and sweat and tears I've gone into them, there have been some gains, but we also understand from hearing from folks from inside that many of these demands have not been realized yet. And so we need to continue to fight um, until and to get those things to reduce the harms of imprisonment until such time that human caging uh, is abolished. Um, you know, uh, the right to vote, that wasn't a given, for instance, um, that, that had to be fought for um, by folks like Rick Sove, who actually went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada uh, to establish voting rights uh, for imprisoned people and to assert their basic humanity. Um, now, uh, if we were to look at more recent demands, um, I'll read a statement here from the Vancouver Prisoners Justice Day Committee that was published in 2001. And again, we can think about, um, you know, where where this movement has been and where it needs to continue to go. Um, they noted uh, here uh, that, um, you know, they wanted the right to recognize August 10th without reprisals. And so Prisoners Justice Day is, and I'm reading this from prisonjustice.ca and all the good work that they do out there. August 10, the day prisoners have set aside as a day to fast and refuse to work in a show of solidarity to remember those who have died unnecessarily, victims of murder, suicide and neglect. The day when organizations and individuals in the community hold demonstrations, visuals, worship services, and other events in common resistance with prisoners. 
uh, like the one I dropped off stuff at today on unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory um, in so-called Ottawa. I couldn't stay at it because I have COVID, um, but dropped some stuff off there. Um, criminalized folks, loved ones have been prison people that we heard from like Farhat Raman who spoke um, and their allies. Um, Prisoners Justice Day is uh, the day to raise issue with the fact that a very high rate of women are in prison for protecting themselves against their abusers. This makes it obvious that the legal system does not protect women who suffer violence at the hands of their partners. Prisoners Justice Day is the day to remember that there is a disproportionate number of Indigenous peoples, African Canadians and other minorities and marginalized people in prisons. Prisons are the ultimate form of oppression against struggles of recognition and self-determination. And we certainly heard that today uh, through the prisoner legal support statement and um, Fadi Anad who joined us to talk about um, the Palestinian plight and all the folks that are locked up in Israeli prisons right now um, and suffering tremendously amid a genocide. Prisoners Justice Day is the day to raise public awareness of the demands made by prisoners to change the criminal justice system and the brutal and inhumane conditions that lead to so many deaths in prison and tracking injustice. Again, we have them at the top of the broadcast uh, and check out their work. Um, over 2,000, over 2,100 uh, people, in fact, have died behind bars since 2000. And in the last decade, the average number of folks has gone from 87 to 118 uh, prisoners that have died every year. Uh, that is absolutely fucking shameful. How is this getting worse? Um, Prisoners Justice Day is the day to oppose prison violence, police violence, and violence against women and children. Prisoners Justice Day is the day to publicize that in their fight for freedom and equality, the actions of many political prisoners have been criminalized by government. And as a result, there are false claims that there are no political prisoners in North American prisons or other prisons for that matter. And the truth is, um, criminalization is not a fucking natural thing. Crime is not a natural category. Um, folks, uh, what we criminalize is a political act. Um, and, um, you know, uh, they're, they're, ev everything is political. Um, we can't just allow categories of folks to say their imprisonment isn't political. It's a choice. We can do other things. Uh, PJD is the day to raise public awareness of the economic and social costs of a system um, which punishes for revenge. Um, if there's ever to be social justice, it will only come about using a model of healing justice, connecting people to the crimes and helping criminalized people take responsibility for their actions. PJD is the day to renew the struggle of HIV AIDS education, prevention and treatment in prison um, because communicable diseases uh, spread a lot more behind bars than they do amongst the general population because of the conditions we subject people to in human caging sites. Uh, and, you know, we're, we, we're coming out of the COVID pandemic. Uh, I, well, I'm not today anyways, um, but we know that COVID spreads, COVID spread way more in, in prisons and other um, sites of, of uh, where humans were grouped together uh, in large numbers um, during the course of this crisis. Um, and uh, remains the case uh, for HIV AIDS. Uh, PJD uh, is lastly the day to remind people that the criminal justice system and the psychiatric system are mutually reinforcing methods that the state uses to control human beings. There is a lot of brutality by staff committed in the name of treatment. We heard about some of that treatment happening uh, when the folks at Mil Milton uh, the Milton action today spoke about what's happening in fucking Maplehurst right now. Go back to that clip and listen to that shit and tell me rehabilitation is what fucking prisons do. Fucking that ain't that. It ain't it. Moreover, many deaths in the psych prisons remain uninvestigated. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I've lived on that a bit much, but um, just to say that there's a lot to fucking fight for. And hopefully uh, we continue to organize and try and reduce the use and harms of imprisonment while working towards decarceral futures. Um, so I guess uh, now we'll turn it back over to Elle. Um, we're going to um, commemorate some folks that have, have died uh, behind bars um, since the last Prisoner's Justice Day. Um, and uh, I'll be following along if you need me to spot you off there, Elle. Yeah, um, I also wanted to say 
that I want to draw attention to the Justice for Matthias Archangelo uh, movement in Edmonton. So Matthias was shot by the police. Um, there's a very disturbing video um, that shows the really horrific. Um, so he was shot essentially while his hands were up. Uh, they claimed he was reaching for a weapon. Many questions about that video. There's been a number of protests, rolling protests in Edmonton trying to draw attention to this. I'm just going to read some of this. Um, so it took Mayor Sohi of Edmonton over 38 days to share any public commentary on the murder of Matthias Archangelo. And this is all from the Justice for Matthias group. Uh, when he finally spoke up, he distanced the city from any form of responsibility by claiming it as a provincial jurisdiction matter. He acquitted the city by referencing the anti-Black racism action plan, which I wrote, by the way. So that's a particular uh, indignity. <laughs> as an excuse for how well the city is doing for Black communities. Um, so please don't ever, ever, ever use the work requested of us by community. So that work was requested by the Edmonton community to draw attention to anti-Black racism in Edmonton and is now being turned around, something that was requested by community to justify the deaths of Black people within the Edmonton community. Um, but they have not even implemented even one of those 130 recommendations made in that plan. Um, so just to continue, uh, they have stalled on the plan to tackle anti-Black racism. And while that is happening, we have seen not only the death of uh, Matthias Archangelo, but also shootings and other uh, police brutality against members of the Black community. So Edmonton has been, uh, I know there's a call for, yes, next week. Uh, Saturday, August 17th, a March Matthias at uh, EPS various stations. So please go to uh, that Instagram as well as Facebook and look up Justice for Matthias. That's M-A-T-H-I-O-S, uh, last name Archangelo, A-R-K-A-N-G-E-L-O. Um, so I just wanted to draw attention to that. As we've heard across this night, um, deaths in custody begin with policing. So now, as Justin said, um, we're going to move to tracking injustice and read some of the names um, just to bear witness. But we want to remind everybody that um, this day is not simply about holding these deaths in the past. It is our responsibility to continue to uh, take action and move forward. I'm waiting for this to load on my phone, Justin. It is not loading. So I am trying to actually fill some time. For some reason, I can't get it was open and now it is not open. So perhaps you can start us off, Justin, and I will join in because I'm just not getting this document open right now. Sounds good. And, um, you know, as we um, commemorate uh, the folks that have died since the last PJD, um, let's also keep in mind, um, you know, that um, these folks, um, these are folks that prison has killed. Um, obviously, it doesn't necessarily absolve anyone of anything that they may have done uh, in their past, but um, one form of violence does not beget another form of violence. Um, we're against state violence. We're against interpersonal violence. Um, and today, um, we're focusing on prisons that kill and it's Canadian carceral state prisons that have killed here. So um, from Alberta, and we're going in alphabetical order here um, and using the... Um, and memorial that's been put up here by Tracking and Justice Project. I'm going to link it in the Facebook page for folks that want to follow along. Um, we have uh, TJ Heller, um, who died um, on uh, April 8th, um, 2024. Uh, Tyrone Hunter, age 30, uh, who died on March 16th, 2024. Abiraman Mohammed, 34, who died on February 26, 2024. Um, Alan Sweeney, um, uh, unknown age, died on February 7th, 2024. Um, unknown uh, died on November 4th, 2023. Unknown 50 died on October 12th, 2023. Ricardo Daniel Gramigio Pereira, 23, died on September 5th, 2023. Uh, and those are the deaths since the last Prisoner's Justice Day on August 10th, 2023, 
who have died in Alberta, according to the Tracking and Justice Project. And of course, there's still access to information and freedom of information requests coming in. Um, we are talking about a secretive um, uh, government institutions that don't always disclose fully uh, this information. So uh, seven deaths that we know of uh, in Alberta. Um, so I, I can... I, I'm, I'm okay. I got it up now. Um, as we move to British Columbia, in fact, all those names are unknown. So I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It looks like um, deaths in BC in 2023. However, none of those names have been provided. So we see the absence of um, response to obviously the data here. Um, and so we have a whole list from BC of unknown names reaching back. So we'll now move, sorry, I am scrolling down and just in the time I'm taking to scroll, you can see I'm scrolling, this is a list of, this is just BC that I'm scrolling to to get to the next province. So uh, just to get an idea of how many names, 2000 plus names is, 2100 plus is. So moving to Manitoba, um, in the past year, we have uh, Dean Young, um, age unknown, uh, uh, July 22nd, 2024, Andrew Ray, age unknown, December 12th, 2023, Bolton Pachinos, age 33, July 17th, 2023, unknown, 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 so no information known uh, on May 29th, 2023, Oliver Murdoch, age unknown, April 12th, 2023, another unknown person, uh, March 4th, 2023, Robert Hughes, age 65. Oh, sorry, no, that takes us back. And then we're into 2022. So we have seven, six, six deaths in custody tracked from Manitoba in the past year. Justin, do you want to take us to New Brunswick? Yeah, so uh, unknown, age 48, died on December 14th, 2023. Matthew Marshall, age 30, died on September 24th, 2023. And that's uh, two deaths since the last Prisoner's Justice Day on August 10th, um, 2023. Uh, and if I go to Newfoundland and Labrador, I see three unknown unknown deaths in 2023. Um, and Northwest Territories, nothing. Uh, Nunavut, uh, nothing in the past year. Um, and then uh, how about you do Nova, Nova Scotia? You did it earlier in the broadcast, but you can go ahead again. In fact, there are some names on here that were not listed in our um, like press releases. So Charles Mangapi, age unknown, July 13th, 2024. Wade Mandy, age unknown, June 6th, 2024. Sarah Rose Denny, age 36, March 26, 2023. Peter Herman Robert Verrick Paul, age 27, January 28, 2023. And then there's a gap. So we have four names. We have uh, six, I believe, in the past year on our list. So we can see here that how difficult even lining up this data is. There's some names on our list, there's some names on this list that we didn't have. So again, it should not take this much effort just to find out the state is responsible for these people. They're in custody, which means they are responsible for them. And then you can't even find a name. Uh, moving to Ontario. Um, I, I'll get this one. So there's, uh, there's eight unknown unknowns in 2023. Um, big shout out to Ministry of Soul Gen in Ontario. Um, I've dealt with you all in your FOI offices um, and can certainly speak to the degree of secrecy with which uh, Solgen operates in Ontario, and we see it right here pretty clearly. Eight unknown unknowns. Um, you've erased people's names as you erase their humanity behind bars. Um, no surprise there. Um, Prince Edward Island. One unknown, age 65, uh, on February 7th, 2024. Um, Quebec, we have Jacques Dumont, age unknown, June 24th, 2024. Robert Picton, 
age 74, uh, May 31st, 2024. Uh, Roland Lachance, age unknown, May 31st, 2024. Jean Brousseau, age unknown, 2024, uh, May 26th. Stephen Belanger, age unknown, May 21st, 2024. Riel Longley, uh, age unknown, May 3rd, 2024. Robert Rousseau, age unknown, uh, April 15th, 2024. Kevin Brisson Duquette, uh, age unknown, March 3rd, 2024. Joey Bruin Lamontagne, age 34, April 18th, uh, sorry, February 18th, 2024. Carol Bujold, age unknown, December 13th, 2023. Lawrence Steve Perron, age 40, December 11th, 2023. Michelle de Mer Levesque, age unknown, November 14th, 2023. Jean Hamlin, age unknown, September 29th, 2023. Daniel Belisle, age unknown, September 25th, 2023. Jean Leduc, age unknown, June 21st, 2023. I'll go back all of 2023, I guess. There's a lot of these names. Serge Gagnon, age unknown, June 8th, 2023. Sylvain Duquette, age 57, May 22nd, 2023. Norman Rosenblum, age 70, May 15th, 2023. Renaud Lepage, age unknown. April 10th, 2023. Richard Baudin, age unknown, April 29th, April 9th, 2023. Jason Gagné, age 35, April 6th, 2023. Marc-Angé Goudreau, age unknown, April 3rd, 2023. Steve Serret, age unknown, February 19th, 2023. Gilles Auger, uh, January 25th, 2023. Sebastian Chamberlain, January 2nd, 2023. And again, um, just to comment, I know you said this earlier, Justin, often, you know, there are some people who die in prison that people clearly, you know, are like, well, I don't have empathy or compassion for that. And this isn't about like excusing what they did or not having compassion for the victims, but uh, we recognize actually there is a continuum between the state violence and the violence that also takes place, for example, when courts do not investigate the deaths of women because they believe that those women are worth less. So um, in recognizing these deaths, that does not mean that we are um, like supporting everything that people may have done, but as Justin said, violence and death does not heal other forms of violence and death. Uh, Justin, go ahead. As 14 deaths in, in prisons located in Quebec, um, so-called Quebec, uh, since the last Prisoner's Justice Day. Um, so it does, uh, that, that is the most, uh, I think, out of all the jurisdictions we've read out so far. Um, so now Saskatchewan, again, we're doing this in alphab alphabetical order. Um, Stuart Kevin, unknown age, um, he died on... Uh, on May 17th, 2024, uh, Stuart Neubauer, age 60, died on January 31st, 2024. Rocky uh, Michance, uh, age 29, died on January 29th, 2024. Joseph uh, Thoberger died at age 81. Why is someone in 81? In, in, I mean, why is anyone in prison? But why is someone who's 81 in prison? Um December 12th, 2023. Um, so that's four deaths since the last prisoner's justice day, at least uh, in prisons located in Saskatchewan. Uh, there are none uh, in the Yukon. Um, and uh, that is uh, the end of our uh, memorial list uh, today. And thank you to the folks at Tracking Injustice for doing all the heavy lifting um, on that. Uh, it's very difficult very difficult work um so uh good good on you for keeping up the good fight and at least holding the state accountable for who they kill um so uh that brings us to the end of the broadcast thank you everyone for joining us live or i assume the many people that will watch this later um part of the point of doing this broadcast is also to create an archive as we've seen um, simply naming people who have died in custody is a nearly impossible venture in this country. So part of 
this broadcast is just to create a record that we were here, that we did care, that people's lives did matter, that people loved them, and that people did say something. So whether you watch live, whether you're catching this later, whether you watch part of this later, um, it has been important that we have all taken the time today to be here um, live in person at various events. So that does bring us to a close. We want to thank everybody who helped by getting clips, um, by participating in live interviews, um, the many advocates, families, and incarcerated people across Canada who make this day happen and whose names, um, many more that have not been named on this broadcast, everyone who showed up um, to attend events and many more. So I'm Elle Jones. Uh, I was joined here by Justin Pichet, also doing the tech. Um, and I think that's it from us. So we are bringing this to a close. I'll let Justin say some closing remarks. Thank you all of you for joining us. We do again ask you as you've watched this broadcast to do click and check out the links, um, share, take action, um, even small things. We've heard things people can do from um, you know, posting things, advocating, doing political advocacy, doing community support, mutual aid, helping people get phone calls, writing to people, making relationships with people, um, driving people to the prison, all kinds of things that you can do that help us beat down these walls a little bit more. And I'll throw it over to you, Justin, for your final words. Right. So if, if folks are, are interested in continuing to watch PJD uh, coverage, do uh, go to Facebook and go to Vancouver Prison Justice Groups and click on the live button that's circled in red. Um, you'll be able to, um, I might as well just show it to you. Hold on a sec. Um, you'll be able to continue uh, to watch what they're doing there. So if you can see my cursor right now, you click on this live button and that will bring you to uh, their broadcast. So you can continue watching there. Uh, just to say that um, next year, uh, this year was the 50th anniversary of the death of Eddie Nalen. Um, who really spurred this movement. He died alone in solitary confinement on August 10th, 1974. Um, the first PJD was held at Millhaven, uh, August 10th, 1975. Um, next year, August 10th, 2025, um, is going to be the 50th Prisoner's Justice Day. Um, so everyone who's watching uh, from across the country and other places in the world, if you're watching it live or watching the recordings, um, this is a bit of a call to action. Uh, 15 year, 50 years of PJD. Um, let's think about how we want to organize and, and do some actions around that. Uh, perhaps maybe we should bring the fight right to Millhaven next year or, you know, parliament or whatever. We can think about bringing us all together to, to do uh, stuff to support uh, folks on the inside, get their demands out there um, and do that work early, often and hard. Um, so hope to see you all. Uh, next August 10th, um, whether it's virtually or, or in person, I sure as shit hope I don't have fucking COVID this time next year. Um, anyways, I hope none of you have COVID now or this time next year either. Um, anyways, um, thank you Jeff, for joining us with COVID. Um, yeah. so on that note, again, thank you for joining us for this broadcast. Do, uh, keep abreast of all these events. There's many, many links and we do ask you, um, to visit those links, take a minute just to visit the different um, resources and also movements that have been shared. Uh, so on that note, we're going to leave you. Um, take care of yourselves. I know we've shared some really heavy material tonight, so um, do take some time to, um, you know, um, when we encounter these horrors, it has an effect on us. So take some time to reflect on that. Um, take some time to find some space to heal with others and then we keep moving forward and pushing for those behind bars who live in these situations 24 hours a day so um justice to all prisoners we are not free till all of us are free thank you for joining us and have a good night <laughs>